entertaining, informative, and educational. Inspiring content that makes a difference. This is the Maximus Troy Publications Broadcasting Network. Join the Academy. show was brought to you by the Breeders Academy, where we will help you to increase your knowledge of breeding, advance your skills as a breeder, and help you to improve the quality and performance of your fowl. As a member, we'll provide you with the roadmap that you will need to create a true family or strain. I urge you to check it out. You've got nothing to lose and you can cancel at any time. You also have a 30-day money-back guarantee. Simply go to www.breedersacademy.com to sign up. The Breeders Academy will not only change the way you think about breeding, but improve the way you breed your fowl. I hope to see you there. So let's get started. Okay, welcome to another episode of Bread to Perfection. I'm Kenny Troiano, and I'm here with my co-host today, Frank Bradley. How you doing, Frank? Hey, I'm doing excellent, Kenny. Uh, we've been having some real nice weather, beautiful weather, actually. And, uh, you know, we've got last year's stags coming on. You know, they're maturing. I, was, I stand out on the yard there just yesterday, and it was like 63 degrees. The sun was out, and I was just looking at all the – you know, the eight to 10 months old stags and just sitting there at all with them, you know, it just, they're maturing, they're getting where they need to be. So this is a time of year where we actually send the rewards of our breeding from last year. And I'm excited. I've, I've got my pen set up already for this year. Yeah, I agree. My, my birds are looking really good. Uh, the feathers are a little dry right now because we're having Santa Ana. So we have the real warm winds coming from the desert right now. So it's been a little weird, uh, really high winds. Um, so it's been kind of, kind of different we don't get this very often but um and especially this time of year because this time of year is still usually pretty cool it's been pretty warm um this is going to be a really special episode um it's actually one of my favorite topics so for you guys listening who are not members um i suggest that you get on facebook or maybe uh yeah facebook or youtube i was thinking of my mind switch and watch them as much as you can, because after about five or six days, seven tops, I'm going to take it off and it's going to go into the archives of the Breeders Academy, like everything else. I, I keep very little on Facebook, actually. So, um, but it was funny. I was, I've been promising everybody um, the topic prepotency, you know, prepotency versus hybrid vigor for what, three weeks now? <laughs> and I was, yeah, right. and I really, I can't wait to get into this. And I was working on the outline and figuring out what we we're going to talk about. And uh, my daughter walks in and she goes, you know, it's Char Charles Darwin's birthday this Saturday when you guys are going to be doing the live show. I go, oh, crap, you're right. So I says, we got to cover it. We got to cover it in some way, you know, maybe cover a little bit about Charles Darwin. Uh, I find him very fascinating. And uh I thought, what's a, what's a good way to cover this that's going to interest our listeners? And I thought, let's talk about the mechanisms of evolution and how they relate to selective breeding. So I got, I thought that was a really good way because when you think about it, evolution was, I would say it's the first thing when it comes to breeding and sci the science of breeding, it was the first thing I, I jumped into. It, I knew a lot about breeding methods. I understood a lot about uh, um, all the different facets of breeding, you know, mating, mating, breeding methods, a whole bit. Um, but it wasn't until I jumped into evolution that I said, wow, you know, really opened my eyes that I, you know, Darwin, he took 
artificial selection, which we call selective breeding, to help prove natural selection, to get people to understand how it all works. And I found it very fascinating to take natural selection and understand that for what it is and then apply it to selective breeding. And then it wasn't until I, I got a really good understanding of that, of that that I dove into Mendelism and genetics and it all just worked. I think if I would have jumped into genetics first uh, and then evolution, I don't think I would understand it today like I do, you know, so. Yeah, but well, you know, Kenny, without him, we wouldn't be sitting here today talking or any other show talking about breeding. I don't think, you know, he was the one that opened all of our eyes to basically the programs that we have right now with breeding game fowl or any fowl for that matter, any species. Yeah. The, the founders effect, which a lot of people don't understand had a lot to do with the founding, uh, the founders program that I created. And that's why I call it the founders program. And we're going to, we're going to kind of dive into some of those. Um, but if you really want to understand how the founders program is laid out and how it works, I think it's the breeding program. I have not heard anything to this date that matches what the founders program can do. So we're going to do that. But you know, this morning when I got on the computer, this is what popped up on my screen. I was like, <laughs> wow, this is, you know, this is so cool. So um, I, I thought this was a good time to, to uh, jump into it. it. It just lined up perfect. It is, t I mean, today is Charles, Bron uh, Charles Darwin's uh, birthday. And uh, I don't know if a lot of people understand this, but, or even realize it, but he was born on the exact same day um, as Abraham Lincoln. Okay. So not same year, same day, the whole bit. They were, you know, two great exact men. same birthdays. Yep. Two that's that's awesome. Two <laughs> incredible people born on the same exact day. So in honor of this, we're both wearing our Charles Darwin yep. Tree of Life shirts. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, and if you don't have it, you can get it on Amazon.com. I think they're kind of cool. I love sciencey type T-shirts. Now, uh, I got the black and the red, uh -huh. uh, but I think I like the. You know, I'm a I'm a sucker for red, so I, I, I really love the red. Yeah. Well, I thought I, I wore. I have <laughs> multiple colors too. I have a black. I have a gray, and I have this one. I might have a blue too, but I thought this was this is a little more flashy. Will get your attention a little bit more. So. But do you get a lot? Do you wear yours out? Because I've worn mine out a couple of times, like after the show, and people will walk up and they'd look at my shirt and they'd get a question mark above their head, and they'd be saying, "What the hell's that?" You know. Yeah. And then well, I start explaining it to them. I do get looks like they're like, "What the heck?" kind of look. Yeah. Um, but I get people coming. Oh, that is so cool! The tree of life, because it surprises me actually when somebody understands what this means. It would have me. And, uh, so I, I put this together, like I said, and I did this this morning. I threw his picture on there. I found a, a PNG file for the, the tree of life. It's kind of a, it's changed just a little bit. This is the actual one out of his book that, um, he kind of, what, what happened was he had an idea that everything comes from a common, um, uh, my mind just went blank. Uh, what's the word for it? Place. Yeah, common ancestor, basically. We all derive from the same place. And then we branched out into different branches and leaf, uh, twigs and things like that. And then, uh, yeah, so I thought I thought that was kind of cool. And when I found it on the shirt, I had I had to have it. Um, well, they, all, they always called it uh, the, the life tree or the, now I think they call it the universal life tree. Universal I haven't heard that. Life tree. I just yeah. always understood it as the tree of life. Dar uh, all the classes. Darwin's tree of life. Uh, in my online classes, they, they refer to it as a universal tree of life. Oh, cool. Yeah. I, um, so what I did too, is I went on fa my Facebook page, my groups page, and I wanted to kind of get understanding or try to see where everybody was as far as their understanding of evolution. And do they see that there's a connection between evolution and selective breeding? Okay. And I was kind of surprised and right. I just looked at the, uh, a few minutes ago and, uh, what I said basically was, do you understand the connection between evolution and selective breeding and how it can improve the way we create our strains, which is basically what this show is going to be about. And uh, yeah, surprise. The no's were 125 to yes, 90, which is incredible to me. Okay. But then I went in there and looked at who was saying yes. And I would say most of them are actually members of the Breeders Academy. 
So that made me kind of proud. And then I threw on there just for uh, giggles. Um, <laughs> don't care. Who don't care? And I actually got Dude. two of them. <laughs> so I thought, okay, well, you know. You know, so, I asked the question when I saw those two. I told Kenny, I said, well, what are they doing in the group then? That's what I'm wondering. You know? Yeah. So, so, well, this this goes with what you just said. goes with this other poll I did. What was it, last week? Yeah. Was, uh, are you interested in creating a strain or a signature line? Or are you interested only in crossbreeding and infusion? Because some people, they don't, they once see it as infusion, one sees it as crossbreeding. And uh, this actually made me feel pretty good because it kind of showed me that there's a lot of people who are actually interested in breeding and creating their own strains. And the, the creating of your own strain was 352. That was by today. Okay. I kept popping it up saying, keep tr contributing. I want to see where you're at. Crossbreeding was 62 and infusion was 30. Yeah. 36. And uh, my, the same question came over to me is like, why the ones that are crossbreeding infusion? What the heck are you following me for? <laughs> what are you doing in my Facebook page? Because you're obviously not learning anything. So just hopefully we can. <laughs> yeah, just maybe. It around. That's okay. As long as they don't cause trouble, they can troll all they want and listen in. Um, I have no problem with that. But um, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe we convert them. And That's we have. I mean, we do have some people in the Brewers Academy that went in there thinking, because they asked me, is does it really cover crossbreeding or you know creating hybrids and stuff? I said absolutely. I can help mm -hmm. you with that too because genetics is even more important when you're crossing birds. You're dealing with more uh, genetic diversity. Um, that's when like the Punnett square comes into play, and we can determine the genes that are expressed by the phenotypes that we're looking at. Definitely, it works. I can help you with that too. And then I noticed a handful of them actually um convert it they said i had like when i'm reading i like the idea of creating a strain uh, this is uh, the founders program looks like the best program i've ever seen so i've converted them actually to the idea because we said a million times frank the idea of creating a, um, a cross to produce hybrid works better when you have two pure families to do it with okay the more pure and inbred they are um the more proponent they're going to be and the better hybrid vigor you're going to get when you cross them you know, yeah. so. you know, just because you're a firm believer on crossbreeding and infusion, sometime or another, you know, to get the maximum out of that, you still got to know how to purify a family to get that to even work. So there's no way around it. Either, you know, you have a purified family or you're not going to have uh, the chickens that you're looking for, basically. Yeah, Adam says, uh, Charles Darwin is my hero. I, I, agree, I agree, man. <laughs> I think... I mean, I can't say I love genetics, but I think they're important and I think you need to know it, but I love evolution. I love the mechanisms of evolution. I love uh, studying Charles Darwin and how he came up with it, you know, in the Galapagos Islands. I love all that stuff. It's awesome. If you put, if you put all of his work and you take it in and use it as in your breeding, it will make you so much more a better breeder. It has me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. You know, the Facebook groups, I don't know if people realize it, man, that thing is growing. I know we talked about this last week, but that thing is taking off. We're getting like three or 400 people every day. It's like three to 4,000 people a week. That's how fast that thing is going. And it's reflective to the website too, because we're getting more members because of it too. So it's doubled, you know, it's doubled since yeah. December, first yeah. of December. More so, than double. And uh, yeah, more than double. Yeah. So I really appreciate it. I, I, I know a lot, not everybody's going to join the Breers Academy. And I don't think everybody should. There's some people just, this is not for them. This is, this can be a lot of work. This could, this takes a little, you know, initiative on your end. And I give you the information. It's all there. You don't even have to search the internet for it. It's all there for you. And then, you know, if you don't find it, you just let me know and I'll do my best to get it in there as fast as I can. So yeah, this is so cool. I'm so excited. You know, um, things are really working out great. Um, as far as uh, the members in the Breeders Academy, uh, we talked about this, I think, last week, too. Uh, we're doing a members live Q&A on the 27th. We were mm -hmm. hoping to do it earlier, but every time we looked, it was Super Bowl this weekend. We got uh, Daytona, Daytona 500. So we decided, I think, the 27th, which is a Sunday, is the best day for now. Uh, because if you guys don't show up to ask your questions, it doesn't work. I mean, we're this is what it's all about, you know. And uh, yeah. 
the last two we've had a good turnout. I was really, uh, really, uh, it was really good having that many people. And a lot of them was asking questions, you know, and, and we had a great time. I had yeah. really a lot of fun. And, the, with and the members said they liked it too. Yeah. Because yeah, we're doing really a lot it. of new things for, in the membership that we weren't doing before, like the uh, master's class video series. By the way, lesson seven is recorded and on the website. I'll be converting it to a webinar setting pretty soon. So I got to go in, edit, put the banners in that I uh, that I want to put in, in certain places. Uh, maybe a video here. I, you know, there's some things I do to make it even better than what you saw. So that will be uh, soon. We plan on recording lesson eight real soon. So be looking out for that. I'll try to send you an email. I'll leave you a message on the website. I may even put it on uh, Facebook. I'll do everything I can to get you guys' attention so that you can participate and watch us do it and maybe ask questions. Just make sure they're relative to the topic at hand. And then we usually do a little Q&A at the end, which was fun too. You know, yeah, that was great. Yeah. Um, so, and then what, one of the things we're doing that we weren't doing before was what we were talking about a second ago was the actual members Q&A which we can go deep. They can ask questions about the website. We can show them how to navigate it. We can talk about breeding, the founders program, and going deep the way we like to go. And the same thing with the master's class video series. Really, Kenny, it's like a giant, uh, it's like a classroom coaching call, I it guess is. you could say. Really, mm -hmm. you know. So, uh, you know, we uh, you spoke of this uh, before we ever had it. And, you know, even though we love the coaching calls, a lot of the questions can be answered through these masterclass videos because they're interacting with us. They're asking the questions. So, you know, it's like I said, it's just like a huge coaching call. that we're having. And what I like about the way we're doing it right now is before Frank and I would record it mm -hmm. and then I'd have to go back and do everything I wanted to do to it. Right now we're recording it with them actually being able to sit in there and watch us do it. And then it goes immediately on the website. So you guys can keep watching it. And then when I fix it up, you can watch it again. So I think if we do it that way, we're going to be able to do more of them more often, I guess you could say, you know, um, because it was, there's some work to be done and it does take a little time to get them all done. If we have to do them all one at a time, uh, the founders program, just keep for the members, keep an eye on that. I'm constantly working on that, altering it, changing it, making it better. Um, you name it. So We've got, uh, I've done a lot of work to it. Eventually, as you, as you can see, it's being uh, divided into sections and each section is going to have its own banner. And I'm just working my way down. If you notice that, that's how we're doing it. And then the videos will go in there as we go. Any audios I've done that are related to it will go in those sections too. If we do a subject like inbreeding, let's say, that's related to parts of the Founders Program, uh, th those uh, videos and audios will also be in the inbreeding um, course and the same thing with the other ones. So we got a lot going on. And these new ones, we're just now on the tip line. We're just going over the line to where it's really getting interesting. You know, we're the meat and potatoes, so to speak. So we're at that, that line. Actually, I think seven was the beginning of them. So, uh, we're yeah. getting into the really good stuff now. Yeah. Popcorn Sutton saying, thank you for all the great content. This is a, a, such a quality program. I think he may be talking about the podcast or the live show. Uh, I don't know. He may be talking about the uh, website too. So hope he is. Yeah, thanks. Um, make sure to join our newsletter. I call it the uh, Breeders Bulletin. You're going to get a lot of free tips, free eBooks. Um, it's just, it's a great, like I have a funnel. And to me, the, the beginning part of that funnel is Facebook. OK, so you come on Facebook, I give you some tips, you'll listen to our show, things like that. There's areas within the website where you're going to be able to go in and sign up for the newsletter. The newsletter is like the next level of the funnel. And then from there, you decide whether you want to join the Breeders Academy and things like that. So um, I think it's a good way to go. I think that's how Frank found it, too. He went from the Facebook yep. to the to the newsletter. So, exactly the way you described it. Yeah, exactly. and you'll get those newsletters um, at first, like I think it's every day for a little while, then it goes to once a week and they only last about four months. And then you might want, you might get one from me uh, periodically. All I can say is make sure to open them because uh, every few months I go in there and purge the ones that aren't being open. If you don't open it, you'll eventually get purged off of there. I like to keep my stuff clean. I do that on my Facebook page too. Podcasts is similar to this, uh, the live show, but it's all audio. 
Um, I would say if you want to, uh, if you haven't heard the podcast yet, go to my website, www.breedersacademy.com. Uh, there you can listen to it. Also, you'll see the banners for Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and all the other podcast um, platforms. Um, or if you already listen to podcasts, just go wherever you listen to it. It'll be there. We're everywhere. Um, and you can go to uh, uh, YouTube to listen to the show as well. The audios only stay on for about a week, and then I take them off. I try to keep po- uh, YouTube vi- uh, you know, video only. And then even then, even some of these live shows, not all of them will stay on, just like this one. This one will be on for maybe a week, and that's it. I'm taking it off. It'll go into the archive for the members, just so you know. Uh, some of the upcoming uh, podcasts will be coming. Uh, the, rec- the upcoming podcasts will be uh, Peter Brown. This week is going to be one of the live show uh, recordings. Next week will be Peter Brown on the most common diseases for backyard breeders. The one after that will be Nancy and me talking about genetics. And then uh, just understand a lot of these, especially like the genetics. And there's going to be uh, there's going to be a members version and a non-members version. And uh, so just know that there's a lot, in a lot of the episodes. There's two different versions. The members versions goes on the Breeders Academy. And, uh, you know, Frank, it's funny that I, I mentioned that is that episode we did, which was episode 110, which we did on inbreeding versus in an inbreeding. Remember that one? OK. Mm-hmm. Um, Everybody loves that one. I, I've, I'm getting constantly getting uh, people tell me how much they love that particular episode. And it's really climbing in the ranks. But what they don't know that the one they're listening to is the non-member version because the members versions inside the Breeders Academy. And that's a really good that talks that goes way in. in it goes deep. Yeah, it, it goes, goes really deep. deep. And it, 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 like you said, it's totally different. It's like listening really to two different podcasts. You know, it's so different. I probably cut out. A third? Uh, maybe a quarter okay. because we go into the founders program, I think, and stuff like that. So, yeah. And, th- you know, I, Nancy and I do the same thing. We get in there and we talk. And at the end, and we just don't hold back. And we say, okay, was this, you know, just a regular podcast or is there is there going to be a member's version and a non-member's version? And so, nope, this is there's, there's going to be a member's version. So then I go in there and I edit it for the members. And then I go back again. I got that copy, and then I edit it again for the non-members and cut a lot out because uh, I want I want you to join the the website. You know, I think uh, once you get in there, you're gonna realize how good the website is and how much information is there. And then that once you see the founders program, you're gonna it's gonna blow your mind. It really is. We've had to do that on a couple of them though. It started out to be public, but the time we got done with it, we had to have a public and a members one. So we we, we fell into that trap a couple times so far. Yeah. Okay, so before we get into things, I'm going to go take a break. Karen's going to play the advertisement, and we'll be right back. This show is brought to you by the Breeders Academy, where we will help you to increase your knowledge of breeding, advance your skills as a breeder, and help you to improve the quality and performance of your fowl. As a member, I'll provide you a roadmap that you will need to create a true family or strain. Starting with a cock from one breeder and a hen from another breeder, no problem. We can help you to turn your flock of hybrid crosses or mongrels into a pure family or strain and show you how to continually improve that strain each generation. We'll start by showing you how to select your seed fowl and how to turn that seed fowl into a high quality foundation strain. Our proven breeding programs and specialty courses are designed to take you step-by-step through the breeding process. And best of all, I'll be there to help you every step of the way. We urge you to check it out. You have nothing to lose, and you can cancel at any time. You also have a 30-day money-back guarantee. Simply go to www.breedersacademy.com to sign up. Becoming a member is a simple process. You start by selecting your membership level, enter your username, password, and email address. Read and agree to the terms and conditions, then click the PayPal button. Once you have entered your payment information, you will have instant access to the website. The Breeders Academy will not only change the way you think about breeding, but improve the way you breed your fowl. Okay, today we're going to talk about 
the mechanisms of evolution and how they relate and how it relates to the creation of our strains. And uh, I'll tell you, there's a lot of books out there on the origin of species by Charles Darwin, a lot of different versions of it and everything. And I have quite a few of them. This is the one I like. This is like an illustrated, illustrated version of it. It's really a, it's a fun book to read. And uh, if you, this one, I found this one too, that has all three of his books, you know, um, Origin of Species, Voyage of the Beagle, Descent of Man, Expression of the Emotions of Man and Animals. I don't know. And he's got other books too. Uh, I wish I would have pulled them out now that I think about it. So you might want to check those out. But um, if you really want to understand the evolution side, there's some great books out there like college type books that are, you know, evolutionary biology. Some of the, a lot of the biology books, they do a good job of covering evolution too, you know. Um, but, um, you know, my one research, his, oh, go ahead, Frank. Uh, one of his quotes that always stuck in, into my head, and this is what got me r really, between you and this one quote kind of stuck to make me want to find out more about his theories. And uh, it, it was one theory that I always seen one quote from him. And he said, it's not the strongest that survives. It's not the most intelligent that survives. It's the one that's more adaptable to change. And when I heard that, you know, the more I thought of it, the more it made me more interested into his other stuff, you know, his, just his work in general. So it opened up many, many doors for me by just reading you know, a lot of articles and stuff that he wrote and it, it helped me so much as a breeder. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of misconceptions about evolution, you know, and, uh, once I really dug deep into it, I, I really understood that this is interesting here, you know, popcorn Sutton says I was excited to read the theory of evolution and it was overwhelming and too sciencey. Um, well, some of it's not though. Yeah. I mean, okay, let's put it this way. I think we're not going to cover every mechanism of evolution. I don't think every mechanism of evolution really applies to what we're doing, but I think we're going to cover most of them that are going to, that you're going to understand in a different way. Because like I said, we're going to show you how they relate to selective breeding and why I think they're important. It's like sexual selection. I mean, we're not really going to cover that because it doesn't really apply to us. It would, if we let all our birds just run wild and they do their own thing, there would be some sexual selection that would occur. Okay. But we really do control the matings of every. And we speed it up too. We speed yeah. it way up, way up. Yeah. So for me, evolution led to breeding methods and selection led to genetics. And I think they work hand in hand. I think they're both important. If you can get a handle on those things, I think uh, you're going to go a long way. Um, but uh, like I was saying earlier, it was the uh, it's what I learned from evolution uh, that brought about the founders program, which is my signature program. And if you look at it closely, and I think some of my members will realize that even especially after we talk today, that has many roots in Darwinian science. Okay. Yes, there's some genetics is important, but uh, you're going to see how evolution really paved the way for this. And a lot of the older breeders, the ones I studied, uh, they knew this instinctively. You know, they understood how all that worked. And if you look at a lot of the old uh, books on um, breeding, they bring up these particular um, mechanisms often within their books when they talk about breeding methods and things like that. So it, it really, it really opens your eyes because sometimes it, you'll go right over it when you're reading these things. And it is when, when you dive in deep into actual evolution, you read them again, you're like, Whoa, okay. I miss all that. You know, I totally missed it the first time. I think a lot of it. Well, for me, I'll speak from my experience. A lot of it is when I read it that time, it, it didn't stick out to me. And, you know, I may have read it two more times, and that third time is like, bang, you know, it come to me. But it may have took those three times to make me understand it, you know. Uh, a lot of stuff that I didn't understand that you cleared up for me, you know. Uh, a lot of stuff I've got on the Internet. But just because you read it once doesn't mean that you're going to understand it, I guess. But, you know, if you go on two, three times, well, those times may help you out.
Hey, I'm a firm believer repetition. I read things and look things over, over and over and over again. And I learn something every time I do that. You know what I mean? Because when you're reading or when, let's say you're watching a video or you're reading something or you're reading a book, um, you hit my hit points and your mind might wander. You might continue on, but your mind's kind of wandering and contemplating that. And sometimes what I actually have to do is read some. When I hit something that hits that wow factor, I'll stop reading and I'll think about that for a while mm -hmm. and then continue on, you know, but I'm, I'm a firm believer of repetition. You'll see that in my website and everything. Um, I think this is funny here. The way you guys, um, eloquent, wait, e what's that say? Eloquent. Well, late breeding in such a way in such an intelligent way without overcomplicating things has helped me with breeding dogs and cannabis <laughs> you know hey bre breeding evolution genetics it applies to everything it applies to chickens dogs cats and plants okay i didn't think of the cannabis i really didn't everything I didn't, anything I didn't any living thing cannabis. I really Any didn't. living thing. That's one thing I, I have to add that to my list. I've got a list of, you know, where all the genetics breeding programs can improve and cannabis is one of them I don't have on there. So thank you for uh, bringing that up. I'll add that to my list. Yeah. He says, um, I learned something from every show and I, and he says, thank you. And I, and I do. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's so cool. Yeah, we do. But when I started understanding evolution, um, it, it, I really start digging deep into, um, the, I guess you could say the origins of our birds. And that started right there with, you know, dinosaurs and archaeopteryx. Okay. Then it took me into jungle fowl. And once I got an understanding about the, the, um, the behaviors and breeding behaviors and how they survive in the wild, helped me understand our chickens today. And we did, I did an um, episode with uh, Tony civil where we dug into it. What I call that thing? Um, natural selection and the, Natural order of, uh, what was it? Of selection. Um, do you remember, remember the name? Of it? I can't remember that, I, but I it's a podcast. Remember, but it's a and uh, it is a good one. It's it really was good. one that Tony and I did years ago on this porch. I was going to write an article based on that. Okay. Trying to tie. That's what I was trying to do. Cause I was digging really deep into evolution. And uh, so as you could see how long that was, that was back early two thousands. Okay. And I wrote out the outline and I was really excited. And so I said, Tony, we got to talking while we were on the porch and he started saying some things and I was like getting really excited. I liked the way he was tying it in with chicken breeding and I didn't have a recorder that time, but at the time I, I had a little MP3 recorder. So I came back, it might've been the next day. I don't remember. And I said, Tony, let's talk about this again. I mean, let's get this on audio and um, I'll draw from this for my article. And recently I, I called up Tony. I said, Hey, what do you think? Do you mind if I use this recording for my ep for my podcast? Because I think it's really good. I'll clean it up for you and everything. He goes, yeah, no problem. And the audio isn't the greatest, but after you've been listening to it for a while, you don't really notice it. And it's a really, everybody's complimented that particular episode. Well, they, they complicated anything Tony was in because they really yeah. enjoyed listening to him. Okay. But that was a really, really good one. So make I sure think, you check uh, that one out. Wasn't there a couple of bottles of wine involved in that recording? There was always a couple of bottles of wine when I was at his house. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought I remembered a uh, just a couple of bottles that uh, may be associated with making that, that that recording. Oh yeah, yeah, that was part of the fun of being over there. Actually, <laughs> you know. So after I understood um, the jungle fowl and the origins of birds like Archaeopteryx, it took me into it made me well, it helped me understand game fowl for sure. And it helped me understand all chickens. And I could see a lot of people, they want to they want to take sides. They want to say uh, domestic chickens or the average chicken doesn't have doesn't have any relationship to game fowl. Well, there's a lot there that they do have relationship to. And breeding is one of them because breeding is breeding. It doesn't matter what you're breeding. The character characteristics and the traits may be different, but the breeding programs and the breeding methods are exactly the same. And then once you get to understand, you can breed anything. I have members in the Breeders Academy that are not chicken breeders. I've got quail breeders. I've got pigeon breeders. I've got duck, geese, turkey, fish, um, fish, fish, dogs, um, rabbits, sheep, cattle. Am I missing anything? God, we have all kinds of breeders in there. And they say it works right. for them, too. Yeah. Yeah. Breeding's breeding. Like you said, even though the methods may be a little different, breeding's breeding. You know, 
the species yeah. of you know just say for instance fish may be different from game you know uh, uh the chicken so but the methods is always pretty much the same that we use. yeah if you understand your, your the the animals that you're breeding whether the game file chickens or another animal and you understand the traits you're selecting th there you go but the breeding methods are the same adam's saying uh that was a great episode with tony i'm telling you go check it out it is a really good it's a fun episode and i think uh you'll enjoy it you'll listen to it over and over again um tony is one of my uh, main mentors i've had a lot of mentors tony was one of the main ones he, he really opened my eyes to the, the form function and the beauty of the bird. And uh, not so much about the breeding exactly, but understanding what makes up the bird and why everything, all of it's important. And uh, the confirmation, the structure, even the feather, the color feather. Okay. They're all important. There's a reason for every, every bit of it. It will give you a different outlook on breeding. Uh, you listen to that episode and plus Tony, man, with that accent he's got, you can just, I could listen to him talk all day. It wouldn't matter about what, you know, it just got a soothing voice. You know, you know, it's, fu you know it's funny. Last uh, um, time he recorded an episode with me, he thought he lost his, his uh, accent, his dialect or whatever you want to call no. it. He thought he lost. I go, no, Tony, it's still there. Don't worry about no. it. <laughs> no, it, it sounds just as strong to me. It, it is different a little. If you look back, if I listen to the recordings from a long time ago, his, he has, it's changed a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Some of the words he uses is different. Like he used to say certain words different than we do, like controversy. Trash. Yeah. Well, I'll say that in a second. Controversy. He says con uh, controversy. It was a lot of times I didn't understand what the heck he was saying to me. Uh, <laughs> um, garage was gar 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 garage. Garage. Remember? Yeah. Well, now garage. he says garage. He now says garage. So he's more and more becoming American, you know? So, yeah, he did it yeah. the right way. He came in, got naturalized a whole bit. I was very proud of him. Uh, how, how long has he been in the States, though, Kenny? How long did um, it take for I him I think to start he was it? here maybe four or five years before I met him. Okay. And that was in the early 90s. So he's been here a while. Yeah. I can't remember if he got naturalized. Nancy may know. Um, I don't know if he got naturalized after I met him or before I met him. I think it was after. I think I knew him when he when he got it done. I so, thought he'd been here for quite a while. Yeah. So no, not too long. I had met him just after he got here. I was uh, introduced to him by another person, and uh, I thought he was going to kill me the first time I met him. Actually, <laughs> that I think that's in the video uh, on the audios that we did. But like we we were talking about Darwin, he he bred pigeons, and he used the pigeon breeding and some other breeds that he did to prove how natural selection works. And I just reversed that. I just found it very fascinating to really dig in deep into natural selection and show how that applies to um, artificial selection. Because I'm a big proponent of staying as close to Mother Nature as possible and breeding in the right season is part of that. So I, because I, I think if you if you do that, you're not going to go wrong. And when you fight Mother Nature and try to do things beyond her capabilities, that's when you run into problems. That's when you you see difference in the form and structure of the bird they could be smaller because they were hatched in the summertime they didn't get the nutrients they were supposed to get so that it, sh it shrunk their size um or diseases hatching them in the wrong time of year like in the winter a lot of times you get more diseases and if you have to apply if you need to use antibiotics as a crutch to keep your birds alive and healthy then you're doing something wrong okay that's my opinion i agree i and i don't use any medications Anytime so, someone says, oh, yeah, we're fixing this and we're fixing that and we're giving them this medication. Or I've been hearing this a lot lately because the weather's been really cold in some places. They're they're actually putting antibiotics in the water ahead of the storm to make sure they don't get sick. Uh, that I'm kind of thing. Raise, I'm not going to no. raise chickens that way. I, I won't. I will, mm -mm. I will not wait, raise a weak chicken. If it's not meant to. Tony used to say it all the time. A chicken that's sick who. And wants to die, let them die. Let it die. Okay. That's what I say. And if they can't survive here on their own without the uh, the help of medications or wormers or anything like that, then they don't belong here. That's just I've seen, I just what, going back to what you said, Kenny, I've had guys and hear them say, as soon as their chicks hatch out, the first round of water they get is antibiotic water. As soon as they come out of the egg. And I'm just, you know, I'm not going to raise chickens that way. I won't raise chickens that way. 
you're going to build a resistance to that antibiotic mm -hmm. fast. And then you okay? if we all do, that's why they've they've turned a lot of antibiotics to script. That's why you have to get prescriptions because they really want to slow this stuff down. Although I do still see some of it on the shelf. I don't know what's going on, but it wasn't supposed to be like that. You know, popcorn sun, he's contributing uh, quite a bit lately, which is good. Uh, regional dialects morph to their new area. They do after a while, you know, but I still hear it in Tony. I still hear it in Tony, you know. Um, so, okay. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about natural selection versus artificial selection. Um, you know, there's many similarities like we're talking about between natural selection and artificial selection. But I think uh, the biggest differences in the two is that natural selection is a lot slower. You know, Mother Nature moves very slowly. It's it's whether they can survive in their environment and how well they do there. Artif artificial selection is much faster because we're controlling that. We're actually determined wh who the parents are going to be for the next uh, generation. So we're looking for, you know, structural differences we're looking for defects any sick chickens um anything that's substandard doesn't represent their breed we if you're doing breeding right you're not breeding every bird on your farm you're looking for the few that stand out that are going to take your birds to the next level if you're breeding every bird on your farm just because you have a space and you just want to produce chicks that's not breeding okay we need to be more selective than that you don't want it to actually look like a uh, hedge you want to keep it as straight as possible rather than it branching out and going every which way. Now I'm talking per string. Okay. I'm, <laughs> I don't want to get it confused with, uh, uh, flop mating or, uh, what well, one guy was talking, uh, asked me the question the other day real fast on flop mating and people, I think the, the biggest problem is real fast. I think they don't have the, the definition of each topic in a breeding program. I think that hurts a lot of people. Yeah. There's a big misunderstanding there. I don't want to get too off topic. I want to keep try to get, stay on topic when it comes to uh, what we're, you know, the questions that I'm addressing, but I thought this is important. Do you use medications for aftercare? I don't use medications at all. Nothing. There's not one medication on my shelf. I don't even have warmers. Okay. I don't, I'm not one of those that warm their birds every month or every week or every three months, whatever. Um, if you talk to someone like Dr. Gallardo, he might suggest, well, if you want to warm them, maybe warm them every six months. I, I don't warm, I haven't warmed my birds in maybe 12, 15 years. Okay. I just pick them up and if they feel good and they're active and healthy, I don't bother with it. I mean, they need some worms in them. They need that for their natural immunity. If they're healthy, they're healthy. They don't have anything that's, that's bothering them right then, but Think of it this way, okay? If your birds need worming, if they got worms, yeah, by all means, worm them. But don't do it every week, every two weeks, every three weeks. They don't need need that much. When you worm that bird with today's wormer, you're poisoning that bird. Yep. A lot of them will, you know, they'll even get sick and they won't eat for a couple of days after taking well, worm. Killing every worm in their body is not a good thing because when they do get infested, they get hit hard. They need some worms in them to build that natural immunity, that um, resistance to the worms. Okay. So every, every poultry vet will tell you that. So and not only that, when they, when they do these real strong wormers, okay. The gut and the bacteria in the gut is what makes up the immune system. If you're killing all that, the worms, you're killing all the bacteria. So when you kill the bacteria, you're killing the immune system as well. <laughs> That, you know, mm -hmm. you have to think of the whole picture, what the consequences are on the whole picture when you do things like that. And a lot of people say, well, I'll just add some, um, what is it? Um, Lie. No, for the natural immunity. Uh, what oh, is it called? Probiotics. Uh, I, um, probiotics. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that takes, even when you're giving it to them, it takes a while for that to build up. You know, you don't want to get behind the eight ball with that. Their, their health and uh, everything is determined by their gut, like Frank said. It is. So, we're, what we're talking about too is uh, that you know when you look at new species in the wild, it takes a lot of times millions of years mm -hmm. to create those species. You know, and sometimes they don't survive. Sometimes they don't make it. And we do this in a decade or two. You know, the creating a new strain. So it's amazing what we're able to do and how we're able to supersede what uh, Mother Nature does. Uh, whether those birds will survive in the wild if they were on their own, that's a whole different story. I mean, we change chickens quite a bit. You look some of uh, or. Uh, the uh, fancy fowl and stuff like that. I mean, some of them are barely functional 
we have to use artificial insemination just to keep them going. Same thing with dogs. Some of those have to be artificial inseminated because they're so off. You know, they would never survive school dogs. Yeah, they can't yeah. even swim. I seen one fall off a pier one time, and it was on the bottom barking, and you see the bubbles come out of his mouth, but he couldn't swim. So they had to put a life jacket on him. Yeah. Yeah, I do agree with this. Like I said, I don't want to get too off, but this is, I like what he's saying. Yeah. You know, um, harp acres, calling the weak, sick, and wormy birds is the best medication available today, and I totally agree with that. Awesome. You know? we, always, we always say this is the main thing. To start a strain, you can't have sickness and the confirmation and the, the health is so important to start mm -hmm. out. So important. If, you're, if you're relying on medications, you're going in the wrong direction. That's a weak constitution. That's a weak bird. Okay. And if you're doing that to your own family, uh, I hate to find, be there the day something really do, does hit you. Breed sick it, chickens, get sick chickens. That's the way it is. Yeah. Every poultry doctor... Peter Brown, Dr. Gallardo, anyone I've talked to always said, unless it's prevalent in your area and you're actually dealing with this in a, a big way, do not vaccinate for them. Yeah. Do not vaccinate for everything. Um, so As a preventative. Do not do it as a preventative. Yeah. So understanding these, uh, understanding the difference between natural selection and artificial selection. Uh, can I, can't, I can't talk today. I'm, I'm telling you. I got three hours sleep. <laughs> and i'm dealing with it i'm actually doing better than i thought i would so um but understanding these similarities between the two is going to really help you in your breeding okay and it's going to be it's going to help you be more successful in the creation of your strains so i really we we dive deep into it in the breeders academy i um i would encourage you to find a way to learn more about the relationship between those two natural selection and artificial selection and how um they benefit genetics. Okay. Yes. Gen genetics benefits our uh, evolution. I guess you can say in a way, but, but they, I guess you could say they go hand in hand. They're, they're in indispensable as far as two methods. And we can, you know, on our part, that's the great thing. We can speed it up so much faster. What may take years or decades in the wild, you know, we can, we can do in just a few years. That's the great part of all these theories you come up with, you know, uh, we get to more or less change the direction of the way. If we don't like the way it's going, we can change it for the good or for the worse. So selection, it, you know, us with selection is so important. So important. Popcorn Sons trying to get me off topic. I can tell, but I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> Poultry grit uh, keeps the worms in check. It seems it does. Absolutely. It does. But what I'm finding and everybody's calling me, they can't find grit. They're having a difficult time finding grit. So um, and there's people that didn't even know they were supposed to be using it. I get a lot of calls wanting to know what size it needs to be and what have you. And they have saying, you know, up until uh, last week, I didn't even know you were supposed to give chickens grit. I thought they had enough in their, their cages or, you know, on the, the yard. Okay. Hey, Popcorn Sutton, I'm going to start answering your questions after the, at the end of the show. Hopefully we'll have time. <laughs> but they're good questions. I mean, they're, they're just a little questions. off topic, I, I think, you know. Yeah. So, but, you know, when we think of evolution, um, most believe that it's all about adaptation. There's many more mechanisms that make it all work. Okay. We look at descent with modifications, the changes we see in each generation. Okay. Without um, the offspring having some kind of a a diff like some kind of variation as they go we're never we're never going to see anything change and so we find that important in breeding too because we need those variations to improve them okay well variations the offspring always look different than the parents that's a good thing okay but that means you need to be more selective you're not going to be um breeding them all you're going to find the few that are better than the parents and you're going to breed to those okay mutations now there's always alterations in the genome, always, in every breeding. Some are going to be noticeable. Some are going to be, you're not going to notice. They're not going to be a big deal, you know. But those alterations or those mutations have are the biggest source of variation that we have today. They're, they're there, okay. So you always want to uh, check them out. That's why I always tell people, wait till your birds are mature. Because a lot of times we don't see those modifications until they are mature, until they've grown up. And some of them are bad. 
You know, some of them are good, some are bad. We just need to learn which ones. Gene frequency is really important. It, if anything, if you learn anything from today, understand the um, importance of uh, gene frequency because that, that has to do with everything. And it's the rate which a gene or allele are produced. And we want a higher, depending on the, it could be the traits that the birds carry, the family, or it could be the whole family. But we want to improve and intensify the, that gene frequency for those particular things. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to talk a little bit more about these as we go. Genetic drift is really important because this is something we're all dealing with. When we get birds, we're going to someone's farm, okay? It could be from a friend. It could be from a big breeder. But a lot of times we're going there and we're selecting a cock and a hen or maybe a cock and two hens. Well, that's, uh, you know, genetic drift in a nutshell. We're taking, we're turning a small population of birds, a lot of times a pair, into um, something different and unique, which becomes a strain. And uh, I think it's a really important one to learn. Uh, genetic flow, we see this in uh, the way people have, let's say, established families, and they're always bringing in new blood, okay? They're infusing new blood. They're saying, oh, let me see what this bird will do. They breed them in one time, they take them out, and then they think they do like a 1 16th infusion where they're introducing new blood and then breeding it back out. Well, it doesn't actually work that way, okay? We're going to see... Um, we're going to see a difference in that family just because of that one bird. Okay. Epigenetics. Um, it affects their environment and that environment has an effect on the genome of our strains. Okay. It uh, determines, it, it maybe changes the way we would select them, you know, by the genes that are expressed, we may select traits that aren't actually passable. We need to understand our families, understand the uh, effects of epigenetics and know when the trait that we're selecting is a, a family trait or is because of their environment. And you see that mostly when you bring new birds onto your yard that aren't used to that environment, you see a big difference. And then you breed them and you're not sure why they're not coming out like the parents. Okay. This is one of my favorites. We're going to cover this favorite. big time soon. Um, yeah. I call it the three-legged stool. Yeah. Okay. And we'll talk a little bit more about it today. Um, but I think it's a really important one. Um, don't don't um, disregard epigenetics. Okay. Uh, the Founders Effect it had a big influence on me. It had a big influence on the way I created the Founders of Program. But basically, it's a lot like um, <clears throat> genetic drift. And that we're basically taking a single pair and through breeding, they become a breed or a strain all on their own. Okay. Um, and if you look at Founders Effect, it has a lot of these mechanisms in it. So, um, and then there's many more. And we're not going to cover all of them because there's just too many. And I don't think they're all um as important when it comes to breeding uh, and we don't have the time either so um but yeah we'll talk about these few today you have anything to say frank before we get started i'm good buddy okay so when you're talking about evolution or the creation of a strain you're really talking about a change in the allele frequencies over many generations okay alleles are different versions of a gene genes are what code for the physical traits that we see in our fowl, and the frequency is how often those traits appear. Okay, that's why I want you to really pay attention to that word, gene frequency, and try to learn that one. It's going to change the way you breed your fowls, the way you select them and keep them going. Okay, and whenever that proportion shifts, like from adding new birds or whatever, uh, that's when you have evolution. That's when you're going to see changes in your strain, okay? And we see examples of this when we're adding new blood, selecting or calling for specific traits, reducing the number of birds within a family. And in the case of sickness, losing a majority of the birds because they got sick and you're only left with a handful of them. Okay. Um, a, a good story of this would be, um, I knew someone one time who had a really beautiful family. It was going good. And I don't know what hit his yard, but it basically wiped them out. I kind of think it was a, a combination of mycoplasma and uh, bronchitis or something. And maybe he even got pox at the same time, but it hit his bird's heart. And he lost maybe 90% um, of them. He was down to 10%. And the ones that were left were very, very healthy, very resistant to disease and stuff like that. But what happened is he lost a lot of his good birds. And he was left with birds that didn't represent their breed as good, had... Um, structural issues and it took them forever the, the whole family took a turn for the worse 
Okay. And it took him a long time to get his family back where they were. And I just had to keep talking them into saying, okay, the genome is there. The, the genes that we are looking for are most likely there. You didn't add new blood. This was an established family. No, not these birds aren't the best birds that you had, but look at them closely as you're breeding them. Look for the vari variations that work in your favor. And we can slowly but surely bring them back where they were. Don't add new blood. And it took them quite a few years, but they started looking beautiful as ever, you know, and, uh, and proof of this, let me bring it up. Where's that at? Let's see. And I, and I show this a lot. I just have to, because it, it really, it shows where I came from compared to where they are today. And these birds, I didn't realize it at the time. I just didn't know better. They look good to me. Maybe I was more paying attention to the color and the station like everybody else does today. But it wasn't until later that I realized how faulty these birds were. This is what I started with. This is actually, people, the beginning of my Maximus line. Okay? They were uh, from Colonel Gibbons. Okay? And I was in love with them. So after breeding them a number of years, maybe 10, 15 years later, the fowl you see underneath is where they, I was able to bring them without adding any outside blood, looking for the variations that worked in my favor. Okay? And if you look at them today, this is what, oh, not that one. Sorry. If you look at them today, this is what they look like today. That's totally without different. adding outside blood that's working with the genome that was there, the genetics that were expressing themselves that I wanted to use. And I slowly and surely, will they evolve even more and get better? I hope so. I'm always looking for birds that are, you know, the offspring that are better than the parents. And I won't breed them if they're not. And I'm still doing it. So eventually they may evolve even more. And so that's what you want to do. And, and that same person, I, I mean, I had to fight with them. Don't add new blood. Don't do this. The genes are there. We just need to find them. Okay. We need to breed them. And uh, it worked out for them. You know, if, if but, you breed enough, if you breed enough of them, more than likely you will find what you're looking for in any cock and hen. You know, uh, it's depending on how far you got to go, how bad they are to start out with, but you can find it. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I say it all the time. This is I'll, I'll, there's some things I'm a broken record on. I see it say it over and over again, and I probably said in every coaching call that I do, is that whenever you're breeding, whatever it takes, you want to breed as many offspring or produce many as many offspring as you can manage and afford, so that you can select properly, so you can cull hard and still have some birds. Because at the end of the day, I don't care how many, say you just hatch a hundred. I'd like to see more actually. So especially with a good breeding. Um, let's say you hatch 100. Your goal is to select out of that the top 10%. Coal the coals, coal the defects, coal the sick birds, coal the substandard. Whatever is left after that 10%, you can sell. Those are probably still good birds. They're just not the highest quality. And then from there, you can search for the standouts. And when we're talking about standouts, all we're really looking at, especially in the beginning of a strain, is looking for one cock and hen from that that can carry the line forward. Okay. That's they're going to, to the next generation, they're going to, yeah. And that's what you're looking for. That's what's going to make the difference. So, um, Adam says, it's an amazing difference from your original birds and what they are today. I agree. You know, and I love that I have that to show people where they came from. That's the reason, okay. that's the reason I take so many pictures, Kenny. Mm -hmm. That's the reason I take pictures because I want my pictures to where I can put them year after year after year after year and see, am I going up? Am I going up and down? You know, uh, how am I doing with my breeding? Pictures will help you in such a good way. Video too. Video is good too. Video. Yes. Video is great. Yeah. I do pictures and video and, um, I like comparing them, comparing them and looking them over. I, I thought Maximus, you know, I named my, my strain after that bird. Um, I thought he was pretty good. Now I look at, videos and pictures and i compare them to the birds today and i'm like it wasn't that great was he <laughs> you know but people still like him you know he's actually the bird with the the earphones on on my banners that's actually maximus you know so yeah. and he was a beautiful bird but i think they're better today yeah yeah you can see it i mean if you put the picture side to side you you can actually see it you know but yeah that was your foundation foul back then but now you look at it from now, that was your transitional foul. I, re I really wow. did think that was my foundational foul. I thought I didn't know they'd get better, any better than that. And at the sure. time it was, at the time it was, right. but you moved on, you know. Yeah. So natural selection is the descent of modifications. Okay. New breeders are selected each year. 
Okay. Start it with the seed valve. That's how we teach it in the founders program. Some traits are passed down to their descendants or their offspring. Okay. New traits are created through variation. Some are lost through genetic very uh, genetic factors or by culling. Now, it's the traits that pass the test of time that will make your strain. And that takes time. A lot of people think that they can create a strain in a few years. I would say the minimum, and that's if you're starting with a really good seed valve, is six years, minimum. 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 I would say the average is 10 to 12. And I know some that start really bad foul, like I did, it would take maybe 15. That's, you know... I would say that's what you should expect. If you think you're going to be able to create a strain in two or three years, you really don't understand the breeding, the the process of creating a strain. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, now, when we talk about epigenetics, we talk about evolution, we talk about um, genetics in, in general. Um, this is a factor for a lot of people, actually. Uh, predation is a huge factor because I see people that don't have proper pens and they're losing really good birds. You lose one of your best birds, that makes that's a, has a huge impact on your fowl. Okay, it's gonna destroy so, you. Yeah, because in the wild, um, they're able to you know the better birds are able to invade predators. They're able to pass their genes to their offspring and they're able to. It's like uh, what do they call it the um, struggle for existence in that they. Um, it's like a um, evolutionary war between let's say like a, a gazelle and a cheetah now the, che the gazelles have to keep getting faster and the cheetahs have to get faster to keep up with the gazelles or they'll starve to death and they just keep getting bigger and better and faster every single year otherwise they just get wiped out okay and the the better the the uh, faster uh, gazelles are able to mate and produce offspring the better they get and it's just a evolutionary arms race and we have to look at our fowl like that we need to stay ahead of the their environment we need to stay ahead of their predators or if we keep losing our best birds or selling our best birds that's another one uh we're never going to improve the strain and uh they're never going to evolve to the birds that we're hoping they'll get so yeah those three uh those three stool legs always you know if one's broken the chair's not going to stand. So, you know, it's it's got to be those three being the max. So what are we saying here? The breeder's ability to select and protect his fowl is key to his success. That would yes. That's what I would say out of that. Okay. Yes. Selection and, and keeping them safe. Uh, you know, knowing when the, the offspring are better than the parents, uh, which that goes back to selection, uh, is it, crucial. Mm-hmm. Now, if we look at the uh, mechanism, mechanisms of natural selection, there's four main processes, okay? Uh, if we, the first one would be, I'd say, genetic variation. And this, we're going to try to convert these from evolution to um, artificial selection or selective breeding so you can understand the, uh, the relationship here. So if we look at genetic variation, the offspring are always different than the parents, or they should be. Um, these differences are either selected or called for. OK, if we look at the overpopulation uh, or overproduction of offspring uh, in the wild, more offspring are born than will survive. Well, we do that by how many birds we hatch. We want to hatch as many as we can, knowing that not all of them are going to make it into the breeding program. OK, so we hatch a lot of offspring. We're looking for the top 10 percent and we only breed the standouts. OK, uh, struggle for existence, survival of the fittest. You know, for us, it's the adaptation to their environment. It's more important than anybody will ever know. We we find this out when we buy birds from other people and we bring them to our farm and we have problems. They want to blame the other breeder. Well, that's not really the case. It's, in this case, it's the fact that your birds just didn't mesh with their environment. They were good there, but now they're not here. And then when you breed them because of epigenetics and the expression of genes due to their environment come out different than what the breeder birds were. You think you got robbed. Well, I'm going to say if you bought them from a peddler, then maybe you did. But if you buy it from a good breeder who really understands his birds and has a really good strain, then chances are it was just epigenetics. It just didn't work with you, you know. So we always take these um, uh, risks when we buy birds from other people. Maybe it's, maybe it's better that we do buy from family members down the road type of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we wouldn't have to deal with that as much. OK, again, predation, predators, they have a lot to do with that struggle for existence, because especially when they're taking their best birds, you don't want that. OK, 
free ranging. When we have our birds free ranging uh, in the wild, it's how well they find food and other resources like water. Well, you know, the the environment um, will de- dictate how well they survive in in your environment. Meaning that they do they find the food that they need, the bugs, resources, the water, and uh, how well you do your pens, uh, how well you feed them, things like that. Okay, and then if we look at the uh, differential survival and reproduction. You know, here's basically what that means. It, it, the birds survive just long enough to re- reproduce offspring. Okay. Now, that can work for you or against you. Now, if you have young birds that are producing offspring when they shouldn't be because you don't really n- know what you're dealing with, um, that could be a bad thing. But if you wait until they're two years and you see the true potential of those breeders and what they're going to produce in the offspring, you're better off. But you could lose them because of predators. <laughs> so it's a good thing and a bad thing. Okay. Yeah, and that's then, not oh, even to mention the genetic triggers you may get. Oh yeah, that on. too. Yeah, that yeah. too. And, and there's not a whole lot you can do about that. And right. And that's why I always say produce multiple uh, lines per, per family. So that a lot of times a genetic trigger will affect one line, but not the others. And you can get rid of that line. That's what happened to me. I had to eliminate a whole line because of a genetic trigger that was just beating me to death. And once I got rid of that and any other birds that showed it, I was good. I haven't seen it since. Okay. And, uh, uh, while we're talking, Kenny, uh, some of them may not understand. Uh, explain genetic triggers for them, just for the ones oh, that yeah. may not know. Okay. okay. We talk about so much, I think they already know. So <laughs> let's say, yeah. I mean, my gray hair is basically a genetic trigger. I didn't have right. it when I was born. I didn't have it when I was young. And I got older. All of a sudden, I produced gray hair. Okay. Um, wrinkles. In some ways, as old age, it could be the sun and things like that. Maybe that's not a good one. But for me, this is a good example, and this is what I dealt with. And it could be different for other people, too, is that my birds at around five or six years old would start producing tail feathers that were twisted, okay, mostly in the cocks. Um, The hens, they were always a little different, okay? I don't think it was a sex-linked trait exactly. I think it was a genetic trigger. And then... uh, but it, it would happen every time that particular line, when they got to five or six year old, years old, their tails feather would start to twist. And I'm telling you, it was heartbreaking because these were really good birds. But and and a lot of times you don't find out till they're older what those genetic triggers are. And then in the meanwhile, you've got all these different lines produced by that one cock and all these different offspring. And some people just don't have. I mean, if that's all they have, that one line, they're screwed. Okay. Yeah. And what do they do? They bring in outside blood thinking they're going to fix it. They don't fix it. They add other problems along with that genetic trigger. Okay. that Those ge- genetic triggers just don't go away like that. You literally have to r- get rid of that line. So thank God I had multiple lines. I was able to get rid of it and able to fix it. Frank, do you know, know can you think of any other genetic triggers off the back, top of your head? Um, uh, Brody of, of, well, I don't. I, I know I'm throwing this at you. Uh, that's the one I think of all the time. I'll, I'll get some members to say, Hey, I've got this and that. I go, yep. Sounds like a genetic trigger. Well, it's so. like the, the one guy I told you, you know, he said, uh, uh, I breed my pullets young because when they get old, they look like crap, you know? So in some sense that could be one, you know, as far as the aging, the, the older they get, the worse it could be. they look. Uh, you but, can look at it as a trigger. The, yeah. the, the difference between the, when they're young and when they're older, I guess you could look at it as a genetic trigger because they are, there is a difference there. Um, but I will say something about that is, and I heard that same thing is when you are selecting the uh, younger fowl because they look better than the, when they're older, like we're only talking about two or three years older, then you're yeah. actually doing the wrong thing. You, that's what you want. You want to wait till they mature to see if they were going to go bad, if they were going to lose their confirmation or whatever it may be, or their, uh, production performance ability, things like that. Uh, we need to see those before we breed them. And if you're breeding them young pullets or young stags, and you don't understand your family that well, uh, very quickly you could be going the wrong direction. You could actually produce be producing a, a poor strain at, at the end of the day. Well, so. uh, breeding them young, like he was talking about, and then you put genetic triggers on top of it, that could be <laughs> really a nightmare in itself, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. that could be really, really bad, very bad yep. because we can, we can accumulate a lot of offspring within five years, six years, you know, so genetic triggers, uh, it's not, they just hit you all at once. You don't even, you don't even realize what's happening at first. It hits you so fast, you know, yeah, it takes a while to get them, but when you get them, they're everywhere. And it know? could be even older age. I could have got that, um, eight years. Yeah. I could have got yeah. that twisted tail when they were 10 or 12 years. 
it may not have mattered at the point. I, I may not even keep them that long. Um, so, you know, that's where knowing happy. you foul comes in. Yeah. Good play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as I see them, I start acting upon it right away. Uh, part of the differential survival and reproduction, it goes right back to what we were saying too, is uh, survival in their different environments. So if I'm taking birds from one breed and bring them over to mine, are they going to survive? Are they going to be able to do that? Are they going to do well in my farm? Does that mean I'm going to have to rely on medications? That's not the route I want to go, you know? So you take that chance every time you bring birds on your farm. And that's the sad part. And but that's like not said, anybody's fault. Uh, just say, for instance, I sell you my birds and you take them on the West Coast. And, it, you know, you've got uh, everything against them. The environment, uh, uh, the nutrition, you name it. Everything's different, you know. So will they do good in there? They may, they may prosper. You know, they may love it. And then again, you may not be able to raise any. The, the parents may get sick and die off. Yeah. Uh, you, just you just never know. You just and, create but, to adapt. They have to be able to adapt. Any family that's going to survive has to be able to adapt. Yeah. And truth is, is whenever you're buying fowl from someone and you're starting a new strain from that, or even if they're given to you, 99%, it's up there. I don't know if it's not, say 95% of the time. And I really do believe this is that a lot of times you're only going to breed that seed fowl one time. And that is so hard for everybody to, to realize. Um, that, so much uh, money. Yeah, you know. it's just what it is. They they have one job, and that's to get the strain going. And uh, by looking at the birds, and we teach this in the Breeders Academy, but by looking at the birds, they'll tell you what direction to go. And it's it's laid out in the Founders Program. If they look like this, you do this. If they look like that, you do this. Okay, so you're uh, creating not a everybody. family. Hmm? You, you're creating a family, and say for instance, you start out like you said with the seed fowl, and then you get up to three years of breeding, and then you throw the 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 uh, grandfather or the grandmother back in there, what happens? You're starting all over again. You're putting those genes that you worked away from right yeah. back into the pot again. So uh, that's the reason Kenny's saying not to, to get, they got one purpose mm -hmm. and you breed them and you go forward. If you breed them, you're going back. Yeah. So, yeah. Never want to go backwards. You want to go forward never. every time. So if we look at effects of, let's say selection pressures and time, um, and we look at the wild, we can see that there's signs of evolution over time. Um, and there's change. But in domestication, in domestication, those changes are usually fast and swift. Um, we usually see them within a few generations. But in the wild um, or domestication, okay, either way, whether it's wild or domestication, uh, understand that those changes and the improvements within those fowl when you're creating a strain is gradual. Don't ever expect huge changes in the beginning. And if they are, and you do sometimes see it when you're first creating a strain, they're not lasting. Okay. So understand that a lot of the genes, like when you're first starting, you're crossing birds together. A lot of the uh, traits that are being expressed aren't permanent. They're, they're temporary. Okay. And you're only able to fine tune them over time when you start seeing the genetic frequency of a particular trait showing up more often, then we know that's a, that's a true trait that's within the family and we're able to perpetuate it and actually improve on it. Does that make sense, Frank? Yep. And okay. uh, just, just to go back, like you tell everybody before that, you know, they're, they're doing their matings and they expect all those change to happen the first breeding. And in reality, yep. it's going to, you know, it's going to take a couple of uh, matings two or three years before you actually start seeing you know, the evidence of, of that breeding. So I think a lot of people, it's patients related. Uh, they expect to see the improvements, the the first, very first breeding, and it just doesn't happen that way. It's going to be a lot of changes in the beginning. In the first few, three, maybe in three to five years, you're going to see huge changes, huge genetic diversity. Um, it's not really until you get into the third, fourth stages of the founders program that you start seeing uniformity. OK, so understand that small changes can build over time and become enormous changes. And that's what we're looking for. OK, but it takes many ge generations to actually create that strain. So that's going to help us build um, um, uniformity, consistency within the strain and get to the point where we can uh, predict those traits and then uh, and be able to predict the, the, the strain itself on the direction it's going. So um, once you start seeing good uniformity and consistency, and you can predict them, you know, you pretty much have a strain, 
you know, at that point. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, uh, you know, that that's the way it goes. But you know, one thing I, I like to stride to people too, Kenny is, and I, I've been getting a lot of this. I don't know if you have or not uh, with the coaching calls and, and what have you, but a lot of them think that you need multiple individuals to, to create a strain this way. And what you want, you never want to do that. Like have three brothers, uh, three sisters, and you're just back and forth with, you, you don't want to do that. You, nope. you want to start them out as a pair, no more than a trio and keep it in a straight line. Don't start branching out. But I, I don't know if you've been seeing that lately, but they're under the impression. And this used to be the fact years ago. I, I remember, you know, people telling me this, that they were using it, but, uh, just like Kenny was saying, it makes too big a gene pool, too too many genes. Too wide. Uh, no, too, yeah, too wide. Broad. Way too wide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It creates too, many too many much genetic small. diversity. Absolutely. Right. right. I'm a firm believer, especially when you look at the Founders Program, that starting off, you're better to start off with a pair rather than a trio. A trio is just going to screw you up because you, you, you just have that temptation to breed to both hands. OK, yeah. and you don't want to do that. You want to pick the best cock you can find, best hand, and you move forward from there. That's it. OK, uh, so don't or here's another thing I tell somebody to do if they want that security, that, that backup is if you have to buy two pairs, one pair you put off to the side as backup and you find out of those four, the best cock and the best hand. You start from there. I actually think trios are a really bad way to go now. I mean, if it's security because you want to make sure you have an extra hen just in case, well, then you should probably have an extra rooster too. Okay, just saying. Uh, chances are something's going to go wrong with your uh, rooster before it goes wrong. I mean, your hen before it goes wrong with your rooster, and I think yeah. the hen's really important. Um, it's nice to have that selection, but I really believe buying a trio only gets you in trouble. If you're going to buy seed fowl, get a pair. That's my opinion. I agree. I agree. Well, now, too, Kenny, I have done this with success. I buy two pair. And then I'd breed them and what, you know, it'd be two brothers, two sisters and whichever pair that I put together, put out the best offspring. That's who I would pick to continue on and just keep the other for a, a backup, so to say. But, you know, uh, gives you a better chance of getting better foul, you know, but that maybe a cock and a hen goes better with each other than the other would. But I agree with Kenny on, on the, the trio. I really do. That's just going to just open it up for more diversity within the gene pool. And by just keeping it a pair, you're keeping everything grouped up. It's, Tight, it's tighter, 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 way tighter. And that's what you want. You want as fewer genes as possible. You want a tighter genome. Okay. You don't want a lot of genes going into the offspring. You don't want multiple uh, parents. Okay. You, and, and this is where they fail the most is they get a trio and they breed the cock to the two hens and they create two or three lines from that. And then they breed them all together later. Well, you've jumped the gun so much because those birds were not ready to be line bred for, in the first place. They probably shouldn't have been line bred. And there's some, there's still some fixation that needs to go on. There's some cleaning up before you ever get to the cloning stage. And I wouldn't clone anything that, um, didn't deserve was it worth it. cloning? That's yeah. like the best you have. Okay. People are cloning birds that shouldn't be cloned. And Kenny too, we're taking into consideration that this family that you're talking about is truly a purified family. They have been made a family. So, you know, you're we've assuming been that though too. Assuming. Yeah. You're assuming that. So that that's a lot of time. I mean, Kenny's been recommending. Okay. People go out, they find their seed fowl. Okay, great. They've got what they need, but don't take the breeder's word for it that it is a purified family, yep. that it is a family. Go on and treat it as it's not and run it through the program. And that way, for sure, you know that it has been set the correct way as a family. You're not guessing. Right. I so, agree. I think uh, we should never assume that they're a pure, pure established strain. We hope they are. This day. And if they are, this day. yeah, if they are, all the better. It doesn't hurt you from starting from the beginning of the founder program. It all works. Okay. Just going to show you what's in there, guys. It's just yeah, going to open that up and show you what, what you've got in that gene pool. I've only, in the time I've done the Breeders Academy, I can only think of a half a dozen people. And I've had, I've had hundreds of people, hundreds of people in the Breeders Academy. Okay. Um, I've only seen maybe half a dozen that had a strain that I thought they could go right into um, the cloning stage, the actual fine tuning stage. Yeah, where they felt small. like they had to stay, It's very small. Fair. You know? And, uh, yeah, it just doesn't happen as often as we'd like. 
It's well, just the way it is. And it doesn't you hurt know, you to start from the beginning anyway. Right. And it gives you an opportunity to clean them up the way you want them. You yeah. know, uh, some, you know, the, the breeder before you, yeah, they may be beautiful. They may be, you know, just a, a picture, you know, but there may be things in them that you don't like that you want to breed away yeah. from. <laughs> so that gives you a chance to do that too. That's such a good point because you 99% of the time, you're going to make them yours. You're going to create, mm -hmm. like Frank said, they're going to become yours. And look at mine. They're completely different. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying the birds I got were uh, true representatives of Colonel Givens birds. They might not have been, but I've seen other Colonel Givens birds and I rarely saw what I would say was a true representative of its breed. Very few, what I would call. They had issues with their confirmation and stuff. I didn't realize it at the time, but um yeah, I, I I think you're going to get them and you're going to say, okay, I'm, I've am i got these offspring. I'm seeing this variation. I'm going to go this direction. I'm going to, oh, I see this one. Okay, I'm going to per per perpetuate that. And without noticing it or even realizing it, years down the road, you're going to compare your birds to theirs and go, wow, look how different they are. That's no a good comparison. Yeah. That's a good thing. Okay. You breed them the way you want. I do agree with that. You breed them the way you want them to um, be. You can create, you can turn a, you can take game fowl and turn them into barnyard chickens. If that's what you want, that's your chickens. I agree. Um, I just have a problem when people start calling birds that don't represent their breed, that breed, whatever it may be. That's, that's where I have the problem or they well, use the, the name game or something like that. Going back, uh, you, you're dead on with what I was going to say, Kenny. I mean, with the name game, uh, even though you've got two birds now, say you get your Colonel Gibbons between when you first got them and now they're 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 not colonel givens they're your birds no. you bred them in the manner that you wanted uh they no more no. even resemble colonel givens anymore they don't even come close you look at them and say uh you know that's kenny's birds that's not colonel givens and and a lot of people falls for that too a lot of people yeah. falls for that line which you know yeah maybe used to they were colonel givens but uh you know after 10 years of Kenny doing all the selecting and breeding and the trait picking, they're his birds. Yeah, that's what it should be. Yeah, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that, you know. Yeah. Uh, that's why I said we need to become breeders again. So we compared uh, natural selection to artificial selection in a sense. Now let's kind of reverse it just a little bit. We're going to take artificial selection and compare it to natural selection. So we're going to look at the mechanisms of selective breeding. Okay, so basically it's a, it's pretty simple. Breeders choose the hands and cocks, uh, and they choose them for multiple generations. Okay, they select the phenotype, the phenotypic traits um, that they're interested in. Okay, and then they develop the offspring that match where they're trying to go with their strain, the strain that they want to create. Okay, and that all becomes um, uh, possible when you understand the processes of breeding, the process, understanding that there are certain breeding methods out there that will accomplish certain things and that those breeding methods used in a proper breeding program will actually get you to a, a pure um, homozygous strain, one that's uniform, consistent, and predictable. Okay. So, um, so each generation as a breeder goes, he's got two main jobs. He's going to cull ruthlessly. Okay. And he's going to be very selective in the birds that he uses for the uh, the breeding to produce the next generation. So those main tools, okay, cooling. So they eliminate, basically you're eliminating the weak, deformed and misshapen birds, anything with a problem. And then you go back once with everything that's left and you select. And understand that the shape of your strain depends on the way you select them and your ability and knowledge about what the bird should look like and the traits it should be perpetuate and carry it on. Um, but understand too, that every breeder is different. Okay. So they're going to have different, what would I call personal selection points or points of selection. And for the, each breeder, some traits are going to be more important than others. And then maybe some of those traits will be important later down the road. And some will place some before others and maybe some traits later on. Okay. That's important. And everybody's going to have, I, I know Frank probably has certain traits that he's working on. He works on multiple genes or multiple traits. Um, I do too. I have certain things that my birds must have for them to be go, to go into the breeding 
uh, pens to go to carry on with the brain program. Um, it could be the shape of the tail. It could be the certain type of station. It could be the color. It could be anything. I have a whole list. I'd be here all day if I was trying to list my selection points. But those are key to creating a strain. But you're correct. It's a long list. It's a very yeah, it long list. I, I did try to list. Was it on a um, was it Masterclass video series? Yeah. So yeah. I start listing them off. I'm like, I'm halfway through, and this is going to take forever. So <laughs> I just said, just look in the show notes, and they're all there. And, and I'm not saying those should be yours and they shouldn't be in the order that I gave them to you, but you need to, you do need to figure out what those selection points are. Okay. That's going to help you improve your strain. Okay. Gives you a goal to, gives you a goal to making your strain. Okay. So the process I just showed you is, um, it's what created a lot of the varieties, strains and breeds that we have today. Okay. Some have more genetic diversity than others. Um, and, but it's that genetic diversity, which is going to continue to create even more breeds, varieties and strains. And that's a good thing. I have no, you know, that's the way it should be. Um, let's see where I want to go with this now. All the variations. Um, okay. So I would say that the in the breed the breeders I've always known that were successful and had really good strains were the ones that use actual breeding programs. Okay, a lot of people think that breeding methods are breeding programs, and I see this a lot with inbreed or I would say line breeding. Line breeding. Okay, For sure. They think of line breeding as the whole as 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 if it were a breeding program. Okay, they think it's the be beginning, the middle, and the end. Okay, and I'm saying no. You know, line breeding is a great method. It has its place in, in my founder's program. It has a place in, I think, every breeding program. But doing it too early or too late can be a bad thing. It has a, a specific function and purpose. So, or sometimes, Kenny, they'll either be saying they're line breeding and they'll be back crossing as well. Yeah. That, yeah. That's really yeah, uh, they, close. Yeah. They just, they so. totally misunderstand what line breeding actually is and don't even understand back crossing. But the truth is that there's a lot of people line breeding birds that should not be line bred. They're not good birds to be line bred. They use know? it for a uh, maintenance. More mm -hmm. or less, they're thinking they're using it to maintain the family. Line breeding is what they think, rather than cloning the bird that they're they're breeding back to. Uh, I see that. I see that quite often, a lot. Um, this is pretty cool. Um, the Breeders Academy is going to elevate my breeding program. Of all my plants and animals. <laughs> yeah. Yep, well, it will. You, let us know if you want to do a coaching call. I don't know who this is. Do you know who this is? No. Uh, you know, we, we was talking about that. I think uh, he's a member, I think. Uh, isn't he? Uh, sounds like, it sounds like it. It sounds like it. Is. I believe he is. Because I think we had him in the uh, the uh, the Q&A for the members. Oh, I think you're right. I, th I don't, don't quote me on that a hundred percent, but I think that he, that he's a member. I so believe. popcorn son's a mystery guy. Yeah. I guess uh, if he tells me who he is, once he gets inside the Brewers Academy and maybe in the Q and A, I go, Oh, now I know who you are. <laughs> we, we, we know, we know it can't be the original popcorn Sutton. So, uh, that, that has to be his alias. Okay. Or who knows? It may be his real name. Who knows? Okay. Now we're getting into some really good stuff because, Let's start talking about like variation. Without variation, nothing happens. Okay. Um, it's the, to me, it's the indispensable key to, you know, whether we're looking at the wild and creating a species or whether we're using it for artificial selection and creating a strain. Okay. Um, I would say in all cases, there's always variation throughout the strain. Okay. There's variation between the sibs between brothers and sisters or brothers and brothers, sisters, sisters, there's always going to be variation there. There's going to be, there's even going to be variation in some of them that are the purest strains. Okay. Yeah. The genetic diversity is going to be down, but you should always see some variation. Those variations are going to be very important. And the fact that there is variation, that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. Um, yes. We want to see uniformity and consistency within our strain. That's re really important, but there's got to be some variation for improvement to take place. OK, exactly. without any variation, you're just not going to improve your foul. So just because you you think they should be uniform, and consistent, which is true, but you see some variation, uh, that's a good thing. Don't, don't think you're trying to eliminate everything. 
like that. Yeah, just like what Kenny said, without variation, you can't go forward. You're just nope. going to stay. You're going to stay or go back. Yeah. So it okay. has to be. Well, you'll stay there because <laughs> some variation is bad, actually. And there's an old saying that I like to, to say that it just speaks volumes to me. And that is variation makes selection possible and selection makes improvement possible. So what we're looking at is change is the variation plus selection calling equals improvement. So we're going to dig a little deeper into variation here. Um, but understand that variation in the right direction equals huge changes over time. Uh, strains take many generations. Or I would say, yeah, strains take many generations to create. Okay. But selection in the right direction equals great progress. And selection in the wrong direction will set you back for years. Okay, so it's really important to understand the true makeup of your birds and knowing which traits to select and which traits to cull. But understand this too, and I and I think Frank will agree with me. Random breeding rarely, if ever, equals lasting change or in the creation of a strain. You know I that agree. idea of just breeding anything, best of the best. To me, that that's more random breeding than they think it is. It's yeah. not as selective as it, it should be. We talked about this, Kenny, many a times. Just because two strains are good in every way doesn't mean they're going to be good in every way when you put them together. Yep. You know, that that that's where that breed the best to the best comes. I've seen that actually go horribly, horribly wrong. Really. We're going to talk about that more when we start talking about prepotency and versus hybrid vigor. Yeah. Because the offspring you get sometimes – um, is not what you expect it. Okay. And there's a, there's a reason for it. Uh, it's, it's explainable actually. So we're going to do that. Um, here's a good one. I I've always loved when we look at variation, but when we look at the potential variation and what that means is when we look at large populations, the larger the potential for variation. So the bigger the flock, the bigger the family, the more potential potential for variation you're going to get the smaller number of birds you're dealing with the smaller is the potential for, for variation uh, this is going to this you're going to see this even clearly when we start talking about like genetic uh, drift and things like that um well this goes you, back kenny uh, to mm -hmm. where you was talking about the trio and the pair pretty much yep exactly mm -hmm. you got that exactly right um yep. improving or creating a strain by reducing the number of birds um that's a big one. And then when I started teaching that, it blew people away. They didn't even think of it like that. Okay. When you really dig in deep into the potential variation, you realize how important it is because when you reduce the number of birds in your strain, uh, they're actually pure. Okay. They're much more tighter in, genetically. So, um, but the only problem is when you reduce the number of the birds within your strain to improve purity of blood, you got to make sure you pick the right birds. Because you can go in the wrong direction. Uh, so you need to make sure you're culling the right birds and you're selecting the right birds when you do that. So that it can be tricky. And I would say if you're going to reduce your numbers to help tighten the blood and make them more pure, uh, you really need to dig in deep like in the, the courses inside the birds can. We talk about confirmation of body, defects, all the different things that make up the bird. Really get to understand that before you do it because you don't want to make the wrong selection. You don't want to cull the wrong birds. You want to make sure you select the right birds. Well, you, you've said it before, Kenny, uh, about going and buying a pure hen and a pure cock from a real good breeder. Okay, you yeah. bring them back home. You've actually got a pure strain of fowl than he's got, you know, because he's got the variation. They're more pure. Yeah. They're actually yeah. more pure because the lower number of genes that you're dealing with and the smaller uh, genetic pool, they're actually more. That's more. what's crazy about it, that people need to understand that if you, I mean, if you go to a, a breeder's farm and you, you get a cock and hen to not relate. That's a whole different story. But I mean, if you go right. to a really good breeder's farm and you get a cock and hen that are pure from an established um, family. Okay. And they're not, they don't have a lot of faults and things like that, or it doesn't really matter. We're talking about purity of blood. Those birds are more pure than his whole farm. Okay. You can actually make serious progress. If you understand how to select them properly and breed them properly, you can, you can make more progress quicker than he already, where he's at right now. Okay. That's amazing. A lot of um, big breeders don't know, you know, a lot of the breeders that sell really, some of them may recognize this, the reason they won't sell, but some of them that sell don't realize this. And, and that's why I know a few that they won't let pure birds go off their farm because they know that fact. 
Okay. If you're a beginner, they may not be worried about you. But if you're an established leader, I can tell you that if, if I went on someone's farm, um, they probably wouldn't sell me a pure strain. But, and I have a, I can show you how to actually, uh, well, I can actually show you how to recreate someone's farm by getting one hen. Actually, yeah, it's easier than you think. It just, it takes a little bit of time. It could take about six, seven years if you, but it uh, can be done. It can be done easily, you know. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's a good point, Frank. I'm glad you said that. Um, so the benefits of reducing the number of birds, whatever that means, um, it can happen in many ways. You're looking at fewer birds, obviously. Okay. Fewer genes, tighter gene pool, less genetic diversity, and the direction that strain is going to go is more specific. Now, your ability to select and breed them will make a difference in there, whether that specific specificity a kid took all of a sudden is in the right direction because it, it could you could go in the wrong direction too. So but this goes back to what we we're talking about. And I and I'm I mentioned it earlier and Frank just mentioned it again, but I think it's so important that I think you'd do better uh to get a pair than a trio. And uh it all goes back to what we're talking about because when you're breeding a cock to two hens from a trio and you're trying to create a family from that um, there's just so much genetic diversity, even when the hens are related, trust me. Okay. Uh, one hen is going to be better than the other. It's just the truth. But if you're taking a good hen and you're breeding to that cock and you've got that line going good and you got that other hen that's not as good, could be even subtle and you're breeding her that could, uh, exponentially get worse or better depending, but there's still going to be a difference. There's going to be some genetic diversity when you breed them together. Oh, you just screwed up the best line. Mm -hmm. That poor line is going to drag down the other line. You never want to do that. Okay. Hope that, I hope that makes sense. Just like taking one good bloodline family and a, a one that's, you know, dung healed and you put them together, you know, it's going to pull the other one down. It's just the way that's it right. is. Yeah. yeah. And so here's a good point too, that you just said, let's say you have an established line, you got to breed and, and I, and I, I rule against this. I, I, I'm against this completely. And you feel that you need to bring in outside blood infused in yours because they been you think they've been bred too close. We can argue that one all day. Okay. The last thing you want to do is bring in a bird that's worse than yours, even a little bit. If you're going to bring in new blood, you're bound and determined to do it. You better make sure that bird in every way, the complete package is better than your strain. Otherwise, it's going to drag your birds down. It's so important. If I, if I went now, this is my opinion, guys, this is my opinion. If I went far enough to say, okay, my birds needs to have blood added to them. Okay. When I bought the birds to add to them, I just, I cull the ones that I had and just breed those because they're better. That, that, yep. that's the way I see it. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't put a good family with a bad family and then try to start back out. I, I just, I, that's me. That's me. Yep. No, I, I think that's a really bad way to go. And it's a, it's something that's been taught forever, and I, I don't understand it at all. I don't know how they think they're going to create a strain from that because every time they do that, they're just recombinating the genes. They just change the family, okay? They change the uh, the gene, the uh, um, allele frequency. Anytime you add new blood, you change the frequency of the alleles in that particular family. Not only the traits, but the family overall. They're different. That's not a good thing, okay? You hit the just, you just. Button. <laughs> yep, you did. You just changed everything. You started completely over every yep. time you had new blood. Why would you do that? Okay, as long as the offspring are going in the right direction and they're better than their parents, you're going in the right direction. They're you're actually progressing. That's all you want. Okay, Francis says that. Oh shoot, where'd it go? Okay, Francis says that's why uh, some br elite breeders will only sell you stags and not a pair of trio. Yeah, because they know the value of those hens and what you can do with it. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that's true. Well, and that's and that's why the breeders, uh, the founders program was created because very seldom, very few breeders are able to get a pure trio or pair. They're not able to get a fa a cock that's related to those hens that come from an established family. Ninety nine percent of the time, they're forced to get a cock and hen that are unrelated, or they're forced to get a cock from one breeder and a hen from another breeder. And that's why the founders program works is because it shows you how to create a strain from that. If you have an established family, it works for that too. But I'm just telling you that's, that's why that program was created. Cause that's where most of us are. 
not very few me people are able to get a pure family. That's what I started to say. That was the reason that you uh, come up with the founders program to make your own strain, because that's the way everybody was, uh, you know, it was like, well, I can't get a, a pure family. I have to get, you know, a hen of one breed and a, and a cock yeah. of another. So it worked out perfect. Um, Harp Acres says uh, that's where progeny testing comes into play to help further your selection. Progeny testing, I don't care what you're breeding, animals, chickens, game fowl, whatever it is, progeny testing is the test. It's the, it's what you need to do to make sure those offspring, the complete package too, are better than the parents so that you can not only progress the family, but those offspring prove the worth of that, their parents too. Yeah. Okay. So if the offspring aren't good, then chances are the parents aren't good. If the offspring are better than the parents, then you not only prove the worth of the parents, but you also uh, show in yourself that you're going in the right direction. Progeny testing is so important. That's a, that's a awesome. That, that's 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 he hit it right dead on the head. Yeah, it that is. Was good. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, another source of uh, variation mutation. I think some people take it for granted. You know, I like to study uh, uh, Hugo, Hugo de Freeze on his uh, mutation theory. So important just to get an idea how it works. And, and it, when it, you won't realize it's happening un, before your eyes, you, you, a lot of times you won't even notice it, but it's, it's there. Okay. So every time you put a mating together, there are always going to be errors in copying um, the parents' genes. It's just the way it is. Just understand that some are going to be big. Some are going to be small. Um, but there's always going to be something's happening beneath the genome that you're not seeing. It could be additions. It could be deletions. It could be alterations. There's so many more. I think there's like five different ways those uh, mutations can take place. Okay. But understand that they're always happening and that some are going to be noticeable and some are not. And it's your job to look at that as a variation and say, do I want to perpetuate that trait? Do I want to build on that and then put that in my family? Now, sometimes it's already in the foundation. You just go with it. Sometimes it's something that's so different than what you have within your foundation. You need to cut, create a subline and create a whole new line and work on it. Okay. Um, but understand that uh, when you look at evolution, uh, one of the biggest variations and what they call the tool of evolution is mutations. Okay, it's the ultimate source of variation. Without mutations, there's no change. Yep. Okay, understand that. Okay, or or you end up with with uh, mutations like we think in my case, Kenny, where I've got the two stags in the the pullet that was uh, that was born uh, raised up without combs. Yeah, uh, that's an interesting one. And yeah. I told Frank, let's breed those. Let's mm -hmm. see what happens and see if it's a mutation because some mutations are repeatable. And you can you can build on them, and some you can't. Some are some are point muta mutations, and they just don't go anywhere. Okay, some are are um, there. There's actually something there that you can work on and build towards. Now I'm very interested to see what he gets. Um, yeah. Chances are you're probably going to get all offspring with perfect combs. Probably it's yeah, a, it's probably a, well. It, it's a straight headed family, and and they've got super big combs. Now some of them has got just a little tit coming up in the back. It doesn't even look like a comb, does it, Kenny? No. Just a little piece. But it looks like they have been dubbed. And they're a straight head family. And I was telling Kenny about this, and I, you know, I, I couldn't wait to catch them up to where I could get some pics of them and send them to it. It's just odd. So we're, we're going to breed them and see what, what happens. Go that way. See? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really excited to see if we get any, any more mutations out of that breeding, though. I really am. I am too. I'm because uh, you never know with mutations. You never know if they're you're going to be able to build on them or not. They could just be something that popped up and you, you can't build on. They just there's just nothing there. Um, but that's how we got everything. You know, Melissa here. She's talking about white sports. Okay, yep. that's how we got the leg horns. The white leg horns are in the commercial. The Cornish. all the Cornish crosses. They're all so white. You know, white is a basically a mutation. No, it is a mutation. Okay. Yeah. And she's right. They do breed true. That's why we're able to mass produce them the way we are. So if you get like a white sports, pure white, no added feathers, and you breed to another pure white, you're going to get pure white offspring. This know? is, this is what always gets me though. They'll see chickens on Facebook and, and so many people will come, you know, I was like, Oh, I never seen a white, uh, a white round head. I've never seen a white. This I said any, any color, any family can come white, any color. Doesn't matter what it is. If it's if it gets that blank copy as a mutation, 
it gets a blank copy for color. So I didn't think about it, but I made up some banners that we were using in the master's class video series when we were talking about this subject. And I collected all kinds of animals were all white mm-hmm. deer, raccoons, skunks, um, everything, all, uh, squirrels. And those are all sports. Those are all mutations. Now, in, there, in some communities, like if you, you'll see deer, where you, you'll see one white deer all by itself. Well, that was just a spontaneous mutation. And then you see groups of deer that are white. Well, that, spo- that spontaneous mutation became a trait, and they were reproducing themselves. And we do that with chickens, too. So it's very repeatable. It's, also, it's actually kind of awesome. You know, It is. Yeah. So it is. Does it does it change performance, production ability, and all no. that kind of stuff? No, it's not even correlated. It has nothing to do with it. I hear that all the time. Oh, sports and whites are they're just not as good, or they have this problem or that problem. They're not even correlated. Color is not correlated with those other things ever. Just like just like mine, Kenny, their brothers or the, the their ancestors are all red birds. Okay, all of them's red. It just got the one that was a mutation, and I set a line out off of that yeah from those so in heart that bird is just as red as any other of his ancestors is you know it's just he got that mutation that's it still the same bird okay um i'm reading a message from karen okay thanks karen appreciate it i don't know she oh she's gone she already left us (laughs) she was telling me she had to go yeah she had to leave okay i looked down and she's not there no more okay well (laughs) i didn't see that message (laughs) I got to remember that. Remember when we get to the end, um, we're on our own. We yeah. lost our producer. Yeah, okay. she had to run. <laughs> I, I usually don't answer her uh, private messages inside the thing. I'm too busy talking that I. I well, I, I had it over on the other where I could see the viewers, you know, uh, and uh, I just flipped it over there by accident. And I seen the message. So, oh, OK, so we lost our producer. OK, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so when we look at mutations, I want you to understand that. They're just the idea of a mutation doesn't mean they're good or bad. A lot of people want to make them out as a bad thing right off the bat. Okay. Uh, they're either favored or unfavored. Okay. They're either a bet- uh, a benefit or a detriment, or they, they could even be neutral, but just the idea of a, of a, a mutation, it doesn't mean that it indicates it's a bad thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's up to you to determine whether it's a good thing or not. And then whether you want to perpetuate it. I think it's just in the name alone. People hear that. It sounds, it sounds bad, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's a bad thing, you know? Yeah. So, but some of them are really good. Better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, like a defect. It, yeah. It sounds like a defect. You know, yeah. Mutation it, defect. That's what I want them to, to remember that mutations aren't necessarily defects. defects. They can be, I mean, yeah. mutations can yeah. come in many forms. They, they could come as a, they could also be a, a, a lethal gene. It could be really bad, which yeah. would mean death to your family. Okay. If you don't, especially if you don't catch it and you keep on breeding to the birds that have that underneath, because uh, a lot of times it's a recessive trait and you keep breeding birds that carry it. And then you breed two birds that um, carry it. And then all of a sudden all the offspring have it and you're not paying attention to it before you hold the, before you know it, the whole family has it and you ruin them. They can't even reproduce themselves at that point, yeah. but they could be favorable assets too. Just know that. Yeah. It's a double side sword. I mean, it could be good or bad either way. Okay, so another uh, form of mute, uh, I'm sorry, um, variation, variations big in um, evolution, so we're going to cover a couple of these, would be meiosis. And someday, I don't want to get really deep in this, but I do think it's important to understand when you're creating fowl because you'll understand the variation you get. Meiosis, you got mitosis, which is the copy of a gene. You got meiosis, which is the creation of gametes, which is the egg and the sperm. OK, that's where you get your your mutation, because what happens during meiosis, I don't want to get into the different phases and stuff right now. But what happens at a certain space is the chromosomes actually ra- meet and they wrap around each other. OK, when they separate, they leave um, parts of them on each other. OK, and so that changes the the genes. And every time you have a, a, a matching of the chromosomes and they split, it splits into two. And then it splits into four for every um, meiosis you get, is that the right word? Uh, you get four gametes from that. Each gamete is different and that's why you get variations. That's why you have variations within the offspring and why the offspring are different from the parents. Okay. The more you cross infuse, the more variation you're going to get. Okay. And depending on where 
those genes are in the loci will depend whether they carry on or they're connected or correlated with those particular, with the other genes. The closer they are in the loci, the more uh, often those genes are going to be carried with the others. The more they're separated, the chances are they're, they're not. OK, and they won't be you won't be able to perpetuate them. You can't rely on them. You can't say that this trait always correlate with this one. You just have to look at the pattern in your bird. So you say I breed them and every time this color comes up, I get this trait too. every time. Then, you know, there's a gene. There's a frequency there. There's a allele frequency there that you can depend on because, you know, for the most part, those genes are going to be carried with each other. And if you don't and you see variation and it doesn't always show up, then you know that that's not those traits are not correlated. Very few traits are really correlated. The ones that we care about and we breed for and look for very seldom. The, the ones that they think that they're correlated, usually they're not. OK, color usually is not. See, colors, I know it's not correlated because color and other traits are on the sex chromosome. OK, so I know they're not correlated, that kind of thing. But. Uh, Meiosis will give us a lot of uh, variation, great um, genetic diversity, especially if they're uh, crosses. And like I said, between crossing and meiosis, it's responsible for recombination and more variation and more genetic diversity. So you can see why crossing and fusing birds is a really bad thing. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about this more. I really want to dig into meiosis and how it really... Uh, how important it is and how important it is to the purity of a strain and how it works so much against you when you're actually doing a cross. So you're thinking, I got three quarter of this and a quarter of this. Well, meiosis says you just have traits. You just have genes. You don't have a quarter round head and three quarter hatch. You have a collection of genes. Whether they're passed evenly without throughout the offspring is another thing. Whether they're correlated and carried on together, that's another thing. All I know is you just recombinate the whole gene pool when you do that. So forget three quarter of this quarter of this, forget half and half. It doesn't matter. You never okay? know what it's going to be. The the only thing you can depend on for the most part when you do half and half is hybrid vigor. Once That's you it. get into three and four way crosses, you move away from hybrid vigor into mongrelization. And it's a okay? downhill spiral. <laughs> it, it, it just, it's a nowhere game, man. It's yeah. a nowhere game. Okay. Okay. So, so when we look at recombination, it's it's much like crossing and infusion. Okay, it, it seems like it's like a mutation. That's the funny part. We can look at it almost like a mutation. Um, so let's get a little bit. If you ever want to jump in, Frank, just tell me. I'm just well, I'm dabbing good. here. Okay, I'm good. So um, now we're going to look at uh, changes in the gene and the allele frequency, which I think is so important. Okay, if there's anything I want you to pay attention to that is this and variation, variation and uh, a little frequency because it, it makes all the difference. It's so important. Uh, purity of blood is de uh, determined by the strain's gene and the allele frequency. The tighter the frequency, the purer the strain. Okay, um, but gel, um, gene frequency comes in, um, well, it becomes a bigger factor when you're looking at genetic drift, which improves. A lot of times it improves the strain, if, especially if you get good birds. Genetic flow, which basically disrupts the, um, the allele frequency. Uh, the founder's effect um, has a tendency to build on that and it can improve them, okay, uh, unless they're faulty, but usually they don't survive anyways. And then hybridization completely destroys gene destroys frequency, it. destroys it, okay. Yeah. Um, these are the mechanisms of uh, evolution and uh, why I think they're very uh, similar to the breeding of our fowl. Um, what should we look at now? Okay. So let's look at, uh, let's take a look, a closer look at gene frequency and genotype. Um, changes is made by the disruption of inheritable traits and their genetic factors. So basically uh, homozygous versus um, heterozygous. Okay, but mm -hmm. the question is, is how many of those traits are homozygous pure and what are their intensities? Okay, uh, I hope I'm not losing anybody. If you, if I am, just let me know and I'll see if I can clear this up the best I can because I don't want to lose you on this gene frequency. Okay, uh, for instance, we look at monogenic traits. And this is where everybody gets caught up because there's so much more to genetics than just monogenic traits, which is basically the dominant recessive traits. Um, 
now when we're looking at monogenic traits it's basically about the purity of that trait not the strain but the purity of that trait so basically we're looking at one gene one trait, one trait. each gene has a multiple allele we look at comb type uh there's many combs there are about eight different types is there nine or eight i think there's nine there might there's sure. eight or nine different traits of comb types okay so basically the gene is the comb type and the alleles are the different forms of the comb variations different variations of the comb good um so basically uh, alleles are different forms of the gene each allele is either dominant recessive purity of that trait is determined by whether they are homozygous pure or heterozygous heterozygous impure so if we look at the combination of monogenic traits Basically, what we're going to see is, let's just use A for example. So if you have a capital A, capital A, we're looking at a homozygous dominant trait. That means it's pure. Okay. The more we have of those, the better. That's the best That's the best you can get is a homozygous dominant trait that's pure. Uh, the next one would be A, capital A, lower A. Okay. Which is basically telling us that it's a heterozygous. I'm trying to talk too fast. I feel like we're running out of time. Heterozygous dominant, um, which means it's impure. It's expressed, but it's not pure for that trait. Okay. Uh, we want to stay away from those as much as possible. And that's when we're, we come into recombinating the genes, crossing and fusion. That's a really bad thing. We want to build on that trait. We want to make it as pure as we can. Now, if we stay, I always tell people, if you're trying to create a strain, the best way to create a strain and not have too many, uh, traits to have to select for and you want more uniformity and consistency is try to breed towards the recessive so the recessive if you look at it would be like a, a little a little a which means recessive and we're looking at a, a trait that's homozy homozygous pure or homozygous pure but recessive okay so if basically what we're looking at is if it's a recessive trait they have to express it and it's pure for that trait like a single comb or straight comb. If we see a single comb, straight comb, we know they're pure for that trait, but it's a recessive trait. Now, if we look at a trait like a P comb, um, it's either pure or impure, homozygous or heterozygous. So we never know unless we test made them. Uh, we want them to be pure. So if you breed the, the P combs and any of the offspring come out single comb, then we know they're heterozygous, impure, and that's not a good thing. We want to breed towards the, the pure homozygous. So that's the difference between dominant and recessive. The, the, if they have the dominant trait, they have to express it, but you just don't know if it's pure. If they have the recessive trait, uh, any of it, they have to express it. I mean, they have two copies of the recessive, recessive trait. They will express it. You know it's pure. I know I mumbled a lot, but did, did that make any sense? Yes. Okay. So the yeah. higher the gene frequency... Uh, is determined by the number of homozygous pure traits. And that's the important part. Okay. That's how that relates to that. Um, okay. This is a really important one because everybody puts their money and all their bets and all their attention on monogenic traits, which is dominant recessive. Very few genes that we deal with are on the sex chromosome. So we, we maybe put too much attention. On it. It's, it's more finer stuff. Um, but I would say most of the genes that we deal with, whether it's our chickens or us, are what we call uh, quantitative traits, meaning that they're measurable. Okay, polygenic traits. They're also called polygenic traits, which means uh, multiple genes. Okay, poly mean many. Um, but I like to. Some people will call it quantitative traits. I like to call them polygenic traits. Because I, I use that as a differential between the monogenic traits and the polygenic traits. Uh, anytime you see variation within a strain uh, uh, or the intensity of that trait, you can and you can measure it and compare it, then we're always dealing with a polygenic trait. And a good example would be um, like uh, the station of leg. We look at a family, they have uh, you see different lengths of leg throughout the family. We're dealing with a polygenic trait. OK, if we look at the tail angles and we get some that are squirrel tail, but some are or let's say they're squirrel tail and some have more intensity of that squirrel tail. We know we're dealing with a polygenic trait. Another good one would be crooked breastbone. You have a family where some aren't showing any crooked breastbone. Some are showing it, real, showing it really bad. And then you got some in the middle. They're kind of showing different variations of it. 
And when you see that, and you were to compare them and put them on a graph, what you basically see is you, you see this bell-shaped curve, meaning that you have the highest intensity over here, the lowest intensity over here, and then you see different variations in the middle, depending on that variation will depend on how high that curve is. That's the mean or what we call the average. So whenever we see those kind of uh, measurements or those differences in the trait, well, it's always polygenic. And, and you can see what I'm talking about. Most traits are polygenic, and we need to pay attention to that. And there's only way, one way, when you're dealing with monogenic traits, when it's um, dominant recessive, you're either selecting it or you're culling it. When you're dealing with polygenic traits, you're actually selecting for the highest intensity or lowest intensity, depending on what direction you're going. Okay? It is improved by selecting the best birds over time. Now, what you don't want to do when you're dealing with polygenic traits is to breed to extremes. This is the worst thing you can do. So let's say squirrel tail. That's a really good one. We all understand that one. If you have one that's really squirrel, almost touching the head, the last thing you want to do is breed to a bird has a down tail because all you do is you get both of them. You get both extremes. There's no medium or average. So you want to take that squirrel tail and you want to breed to a bird that has the most perfect, perfect. tail you have. Mm -hmm. You actually want to breed the birds with the most perfect tails. Okay. And a little by little, you will get to, to that perfect tail. They'll improve generation after generation. Same thing with um, crooked breastbone. You know, you don't want to breed a bird that may have all kinds of attributes, but has a really bad crooked breastbone to one that has, well, no, that's a really bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a really bad example. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that, that would be a bad one. Squirrel tail is a good one. I was yeah, going squirrel in the tail's wrong excellent. Uh, yeah. Squirrel tail is an excellent one, but you know, that's what a lot of people would do. They get scared to get terrified. So if they've got one that's squirrel tailed, They'll take a rooster's tails, drag it. I hear it all the time. I hear and what it all do the time. they get? What do they get? They get Both. squirrel tailed and low tailed. They yeah. don't get that in the middle, you know. They so, they lose that intermediate stage. Exactly. And the, the intermediate in this case is what you want. That's okay? where we need to be. Every breeder worth his salt will tell you that. Don't breed yeah. to extremes. Okay. So, um, yeah. And in, in the same thing, too, is when you're balancing a family, um, let's say you've, you're working on station and it's starting to get too high. Well, you don't want to work to the lowest station birds on your farm because now you got both. Okay. Mm -hmm. You want to you want to work to the pick the ones that have the perfect or as close to as possible the perfect station and breed to those. Okay. And if they're all high station and you're trying to work on them, you just then you would select the lowest ones because you need to, but you're not breeding too a high to a low. That's what you don't want. But over time they will improve. Um, so yeah, that's so important. <laughs> breeding to extremities really can mess your yard up and yep. one breeding, you know, let alone what it's going to do a couple of years down the road. But, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a no, no. I've been there, done that before. So, okay. So let's talk about the rate of gene and allele frequency. Um, I think this is kind of co goes with what we were just talking about just now. Um, selection and culling for uniformity improves gene frequency. Okay. Inbreeding just stabilizes it gene frequency, but it does expose uh, some of the bad traits so that you can weed them out. But if you were to just do inbreeding all the time, those bad traits would, would, uh, they would, the intensity of those bad traits would lessen to the point. I, I mean, I know some people who inbreed all the time. That's all they do is inbreeding. It's and, breeding. Yeah. And they don't get that extreme where you get the good, the bad in the middle. Mm -hmm. They just get a few bout, a few foul here and there that they need to weed out. They have good gene frequency. The traits are good and everything. What they know that you don't know a lot of times is they're selecting birds that are always the healthiest, always the most vigorous. You can inbreed quite a bit if you're selecting for health and vigor. Okay, that's the key. That's where that's what you lose mostly when you do uh, inbreeding. You don't lose size. That's a selection point. Because you just didn't realize what you're selecting. A lot of times when you're doing inbreeding and you're losing size, it's because of your poor selection. Uh, inbreeding does not reduce the size of a bird. It can, okay, it can reduce the resistance to disease. But again, it's your selection because you're selecting birds that have poor resistance to disease. You see what I'm saying? How that works? Yeah. And, and, okay. and one thing I want to stress too, Kenny, and, and I know you get this a lot. I get it a lot. Inbreeding does not cause, um, what, how, how do I need to say this? It doesn't uh, cause 
all the defects that you're getting and it just exposes what's already there. It exposes is what's already in there. See, I get a lot of people that think, okay, because I inbreed brother to sister, I've got them coming out with three legs, two heads, <laughs> you know, no, that was already in there. Uh, inbreeding yeah. makes nothing. It just exposes it. I just wanted to, to get that right. in there because I get that so much, so much. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm sorry to say without Karen here, we're going to have a tough time getting into some of these questions and we're going to be way over time. So I really apologize for that. I mean, again, the best way to answer your questions would be in the Breeders Academy where we can address you. We can do coaching calls. We can, we do our uh, monthly um, Q and A's with our members. We can do we, where we just address the questions. So we'll do the best we can. If I see one that pops up, that's very relative. I'll try to pop it up there. But if I don't get to your question, I'm, I'm very sorry. Okay. So um, I want to make sure I'm covering this properly. The rate of gene and allele frequency. Uh, again, selection and culling for uniformity improves gene frequency. Inbreeding just stabilizes it. Okay. But crossbreeding destroys gene frequency. Yeah. Okay. Understand that. Okay. And the better they're selected and the purer the strain, the higher the gene frequency. Gene frequency is everything, Frank. I mean, I, I can't place put more value on it than I'm already doing, I guess. I agree. Okay, I agree. so um, genetic drift, one of my favorites, because we all have to deal with that, okay? And it can be used in so many ways. It basically deals with smaller populations that derive from a lar larger population. We were talking about this a second ago, like when you're getting a new family uh, from a breeder, you're basically getting a sample of what he has from the original family, Okay. Um, in the wild, this is the funny part, you know, people want to associate it right with like natural selection. Well, it's not really that way in the wild. Natural selection will favor the strong, the ones that adapt to their, um, um, to their environment, but genetic drift plays differently. It doesn't place favorites. It's very blind. Okay. Um, it's random chance. And here's a good example of it. And a lot of, um, Evolutionists, sometimes geneticists, will use this uh, expression. I'm going to tell exactly the way they do it. I'm going to try to summarize it the best I can. Let's say you have, they call it frogville. Okay, you have this area, a small area. They have red frogs, and well, actually they use green frogs and uh, blue frogs. Okay, and what happens is the wolves would come, and they'd only select the, uh, the blue frogs and leave the green frogs. So as time went on, the green frogs would get, the numbers would go up and the blue frogs would go down. Okay. So that would be like natural selection sort of. Okay. Then all of a sudden a fire comes in and starts a fire and um, all the green frogs get um, uh, burned up. All that's left is the, uh, the, the blue frogs and they're all related. So a, a family that was mostly green frogs for a while changed and went to the blue frogs. They changed their allele frequency and became a whole different color of, of a family, okay? And, and that's what happens, too, with us is that we, we get birds from, let's say, a breeder. And because of the way we breed them, we got a small sample of what he had. And the way we breed them, if we were to compare his birds with ours, they would be completely different, okay? Because we changed the gene frequency of that family. Um, so. So it shows us that sometimes uh, some circumstances um, we control, we try to control, we control the way we pen them, we, we breed them and everything. But if a storm comes and wipes out our farm and blows our pens out and all our birds get killed by the weather or predators because they got out and all is left is a pair, then we've changed them. Either, either way, we, what we've done is we've tightened the gene pool through isolation and reduction. And that changed the, the way the family progressed from that point on. Okay. A good example of this would be the marble effect. So if we have, let's say we throw red, blue, green marbles into a jar and we mix them up. Um, if you look at, if you were to close your eyes and reach your hand in there and select them, and I was to tell you to select like a dozen marbles, um, that would be genetic drift. There's, it's just random. And whatever you pull out, it could be more um, blue marbles rather than green or red. That particular family takes a different turn. Okay. As far as natural selection, it's like having open eyes and I, I get to easily select. I get to pick what I want because I'm the, I'm the environment. 
Um, or let's say I close my eyes and it's still natural suction. Let's say I close my eyes, I reach in there and the, uh, marbles are all slippery because of oil and some of them are slipping out of my hand. That would be natural selection too. It'd be uh, more of a, um, uh, non-random selection, but the environment would dictate which one survived for whatever reason it may be where genetic drift just makes a chance happening and changes the frequency by eliminating some birds and just leaving a few others. So it's taking a larger population and, and reducing it down to a small population. That that's makes sense. Good, that's a good okay. example. That's really yeah. a good example. I like and that. We talked about this a, a minute ago, like in sickness, where I had that friend. He lost most of his birds to sickness, okay? Um, and that changed the frequency of his genes, and it changed the direction of his family. Um, too bad it wasn't in the right direction, but it, did, yeah. it didn't, okay? Yeah. Um, or like we said, we buy a trio from someone or a pair from a larger um, farm. That's considered genetic drift. Or we have a family of birds, an established family, and – we purposely reduce the size of our family, get down to the few that are very best, get rid of everything else. That's genetic drift too. Okay. The only downfall is which birds are we calling and which birds are we selecting? If we are really poor at that, we just, we may have just went in the wrong direction. So, you know, yeah. I've had that happen though. And an accident though, Kenny, maybe, uh, uh, two or three hint, maybe got down low on my numbers. Uh, Fox Bobcat come in, Took yeah. all of them out except for one pair. You start raising all those, and it's like, man, what happened? You know, that yeah, that and it happens. happens. It happens a lot to people, and I would tell them that if they're just a bunch of mixed birds, and you haven't hurt nothing really. Yeah. Um, but if it's an established family, I would not add new blood to that. I would do my very best not to add new blood. See what I can come up with the next few years, and see what kind of variations show up, and maybe I can get them back to where they were. Because uh, we're we're looking at the phenotype, and that's important. But we don't know what's in the genotype. We don't know what's in the genome. We kind of do because they are established family. We know that it's in there. We just need to find it when it shows up, and then improve them along the way. And we we can most likely get back where we were. You know, it being in there and find it's two different things. That's that that's the piece of finding that. You know. Yeah. Get, so it's in there. You just got to find it. We're getting to the end here. Um, so the founder's effect, which is really important to me, which entails a lot of the mechanisms of um, uh, evolution and why I created the founder's program. Um, if Well, I'll get in that in a second. But um, it's similar to, I mean, it's, it's going to sound very similar to genetic drift because it's in some ways the same thing. We're looking at building or establishing a new population from a very small number of birds or what they call founders. Okay. And most times, and it should be from a single pair, like a cock and a hen. Okay. Um, random genetic drift does take place and it, it's often called the founders effect when they look at how genetic drift, but they are different. If you really dig into them and look at them, they're, they're very different, but it, genetic drift is part of uh, the founders effect. And so, like I said, it's, it's the, um, it's a program I base my, uh, theory on and how I use my breeders, uh, Academy, uh, the, uh, the founders program, it, the methods within that and the methods that is used in chicken breeding, um, is the same thing. If you look at it closely, what happens in nature? And I tried to stay as close to nature as possible. And the breeders that I followed that gave me this, you know, they gave it to me in bits and pieces and i took the common denominator from all of them put it together in the order that looked like it fell in showed it to them i said yeah that's exactly how i breed but if you look at those methods and you look at the way the program set up it's it's so close to mother nature it's not even funny it is okay yeah I, the first time i ever went over it and 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 looked it over that's the first thing that popped to my head so it's yeah. so close. It's Mother so close. Nature would not do what you're seeing out there in these breeding programs. The one sixteenth infusion, it would not do that. The five eighths, nope. three eighths, it would not do that. This, this, uh, getting a trio and creating the separate lines and bringing them together, it would not do that. It, they wouldn't survive that kind of breeding. Okay, and what I see from those breeding methods is that they're missing two, and I'm not saying what they are, and my my members know what they are. Okay, yeah. but they're missing two very important stages that make it all work. Without them, it doesn't work at all, and they don't have it. Yeah, the aha moment they, when yeah. you see it. Yeah, mm -hmm. but you know, Kenny, going back to that to nature, 
it's like all the game birds, quail, turkey, what have you. When you go out and say hunting season, okay, you go out and you kill a big gobbler, you come back. Usually he's a real of a brute. You know what I'm saying? He's He's got the confirmation. He's got the height, you know, his feathers and plumage and everything's good. Very seldom do you ever go in and shoot and go, and it's a scrub. You know, Mother Nature takes care of its own. But yep. uh, the strongest survives, the smartest survives, you know. And when you go to nature, you see good quality individuals and its species. You don't see sick and weak uh, of that. So pretty much that's what the Founders Program does. It tries to weed out, cull out all the defects to mm -hmm. bring the purity back in to where it's only good traits that you're you're perpetuating. Yeah. You see it in the wild all the time. You know, yep. it's why they're so uniform over thousands of years, you know, because it it cleans up as it go. And the it's always the predators that eat the, the weakest ones out of the link. You know, it doesn't eat the best ones. That's right. So Mother Nature knows what it's doing, you know. So if we look at like hybridization, which is a big one, um, like when we see in like crossbreeding or infusion, um, it's basically the recombination of genes and it, it disrupts the gene frequency. Okay, what I think is funny, and this is the sad part, is people are buying trios. Okay, unknown unknowingly, they practice genetic drift, gene flow, hybridization, and mongrelization in that order. Okay, so what happens is they buy a pair of trio, they cross that blood into theirs. Okay, and then every year they add new blood to that bloodline. Um. So basically what's happening is you're getting too much infusion, which leads to mongrelization. And then the result is genetic, like a genetic junkyard. So basically they took a pure family, they hybridized them, and then they mongrelized them. <laughs> uh, I've, I've never heard the, uh, the junkyard. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Genetic junkyard. Yeah. Genetic you know? junkyard. I like that. And then they, and then they don't understand what happened. And then they either keep on breeding new blood into them continuing continuing to mongrelize them even more okay yeah. and then they give up on them and start all over and do the same process all over again and if you think yeah. of some of these breeding methods like the 5h38s and some of the other ones i've been hearing lately that's exactly what they're doing they're genetic drift gene flow hybridization and mongrelization that's exactly what they're doing Okay. That's the re that's the reason I've been telling all the coaching call uh, members when we do a coaching call. That's the reason I, I tell them take the founders program. If you got your seed foul, don't go on. Yep, they're a pure strain. You know they're they're ready to go take off with right now. Don't take that chance. You take that chance. You do it. There are a bunch of crosses. You're going to have each one of them's going to look different. It's going to be a mess. So you know I'd rather be safe and know they're bred in a correct way and just start at one and go through it just to be be sure of it. Yep, I agree. Uh, so the last one I want to talk about, and I don't want to get too deep in it because I do want to, we've talked about it before, and I do want to cover it in its own show because I think it's that important and we can really go off. We could probably talk two hours, three hours on this alone, okay, yep. um, would be epigenetics, which I consider the three-legged stool, okay? And this is determined by the changes in the environment and, the, and your management skills, Um this has an effect on the genetic expression of traits within your strain. Um, part, some of that you have control of it, some you don't. So if we look at the mechanics or the mechanisms of, F, mechanisms of epigenetics, it's the three-legged stool would be adaptation to their environment and your management practices. So we're looking at climate, pens, local plant life, um, things like that. Okay, I know there's more. Um, the second leg would be healthcare and nutrition. So we're basically looking at the diseases in your area or the bird resistance to that disease. And if we're looking at nutrition, we're looking at feeds, plant life, and bugs. Okay, uh, that's going to determine their health, which is going to determine how well they express the traits and how healthy they are and how able to, they're able to keep on going. And then we look at genetic expression, which is, Kind of on you in some ways. I mean, we're looking at your ability to select from the available gene pool and your knowledge of the law's inheritance. So that's what we're saying there is understanding the breeding program or the breeding uh, methods that are out there and how to properly use them in a breeding program. And that's what the Founders Program is. 
So I can't wait, Frank, to get into that one. That's that's, cool. that's going to be a really fun one. You know, it is. It's a, it's a more of effect on your foul than you would think. Oh, it, it's 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 a make or break, really, Kenny. It's really a make or break. Uh, it's and it's so important. Each one of those is so important to the success. And it's just not you can't be one and good. Uh, uh, just one and uh, the good in one or two. It has to be all of them, or it doesn't work out in the end. No, that's why I call it the three-legged stool, not the four-legged stool. Or that's the, right. It's a three-legged because, like you said, one leg falls, it all goes down. They're so important together. Yep, they all work together. Yep, it's definitely. So I guess the last question I would like to ask or present to you guys and talk to Frank about would be what lies ahead for the future for us as breeders? Okay. Are we going to create new colors? Are we going to improve their conformation of body, greater functions such as chickens that fly like regular birds? Who knows what the future is? Could it be a four-legged chicken? I mean, I've seen some, you know. Okay. Um, so the way I look at it is as breeders, the future really lies in our hands. Um, we can either improve them or ruin them. And if we look at Facebook, we're seeing some of that happening right now. And uh, we just need to become breeders again. We need to obtain the proper knowledge. I think the Breeders Academy does that. I think the Founders Program is a really good breeding program. Uh, preserve the breeds that we have, whether they're game fowl, chickens, or whatever. Okay. And to create strains that best represent the breed, which that means it's going to take some knowledge on you to figure out what that means. Okay. And uh, to make sure that we're using breeding programs that improve the strains, progress the strains, and maintain our strains for future generations. That's what I hope I'm leaving on you today. I would be happy, Kenny, if they would just go back to looking the way they did back in the 70s. I agree. You know, I agree. They were much better back then. Yeah. I mean, at least when you looked at one, you know what you was looking at. Today, it, I, you know, today it's not like that. It could be, you, you never know. You really never know. Yeah, it, it's, it really is going in the wrong direction. Um, and uh, it makes me feel good that we have the Breeders Academy, that we have all those. We have hundreds of members, that we have those members, and they're willing to learn. They're excited. I mean, Frank and I talk about it all the time. I mean, we could give advice on Facebook. And the way they take it, they either, they either take it good, they take it bad, or they don't listen. Or you just get various uh, reactions to that. But in the Founders Pro, I mean, in the Breeders Academy, it's so fun because they're willing to learn. They're excited. They're motivated. They, you know, we just have a good time talking to them with the coaching calls and doing the, the Q and a, it's a good experience for Frank and I, it's a good experience for the members. I, we're just having a great time and it's just getting better all the time. Yeah. And you know, it's happened. It's happened. Me and Kenny grow, you mm. know, and it's yep. happened. The members grow. So it, it's good for all of us. You know, it's a complete circle the way I see it. Yeah. So, you know, I want to end the show now. I think we're at uh, two hours and 22 minutes. It's the longest show we've done in a long time. I thought it was an important one. Like I it said, uh, if you want to watch this again, um, do it as, as much as you can or as soon as you can, because I'm only going to leave this on for maybe five or six days, I think. And I'm going to take it off. It's going to go into the archive on the Breeders Academy for our members. Um, and uh, yeah, so I don't I wouldn't waste time checking it out and trying to learn from it. Cause there's a lot of information I'm thinking, I'm sure that every time you listen to it, you're going to hear something new. I tried to go, I know I, I tried to go to as fast as I can. I knew there was a lot of information. And when I go fast like that, I talk fast and I start mumbling and I apologize for that. You done fine. Um, you yeah. Done fine. So you done fine. hopefully uh, you, you, you learn from it. You enjoyed it. And uh, I really appreciate care. I know Karen's not here. She's uh, I want, well, first of all, I want to fr thank Frank cause he's, the best co-host ever. Uh, I really you, appreciate him, Karen, for producing it. And uh, I'm, it's it's nice to have her here. I, I mean, I can feel it now that she's not here. <laughs> we were able to answer some of the questions because she pops those up yeah. for me. You yeah, know. She, she takes a lot of load off of us both. You know? She she does. I Especially feel like you. I'm all thumbs without her. Um, yeah. And I want to thank you, the listener and the follower, for following us and listening to us and watching us because uh, you make all the difference. You actually help us shape this show. Uh, we do it for you. And uh, without you, we wouldn't be doing it all. So, Frank, I'll see you later. Everybody, you, I'll, I'll see you later. Thanks for uh, coming out. See you guys.